Good evening. This is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narriwarren South. We're broadcasting on a prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and also via the Melbourne TV repeater, VK3RTV, Digital Channel 1, in full HD. We're also broadcasting via my video stream on the YouTube stream, which you can find at VK3CSJ. Just look for the live symbol. Good evening, everyone, here on the 9th of June, 2023 where the outside temperature is about 9 degrees. Uh, actually, it's a little higher. It's about 10 degrees. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, a long weekend. So I hope everybody can get up to no good and uh, cut some grass, because I think the weather is going to be nice, that way not raining like it's been in the last few days. Anyway... We've got a full packed night tonight, well, almost. We've got a few articles and um, we actually have a, uh, uh, a, uh, a solar report from Tamitha Scove, solar weather, solar space woman, that's it. And um, we'll bring her up on the screen in a, about half an hour or so. Anyway, uh, I trust everybody is well. So thank you for tuning and listening in. And uh, I know there's a few folks around already. And uh, pleasant evening to uh, Steve, Mr. HK, who's listening from his bedside radio. <laughs> anyway, um, and that's okay, because I, I know at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, people can get a bit sleepy-eyed and uh, hit the sack early. I don't know, these old codgers. Anyway, um, all right. Uh, we also have a email address. Um, some of you love to send emails to different my other addresses, but uh, the address for the station here for this particular moment in time on a Friday night is vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3echokilohotel at gmail.com because we are looking at the uh, inbox as we speak and we already have Stephen who's uh, sent me an email this, uh, today um, yep okay <laughs> just a, quick, a quick read of that email and uh, in fact I'll just uh, open it up because I only saw the, the top part of it where is my mouse there it is uh uh, yeah, okay, the same same one, all right, fair enough. And um, Mr. Don has answered in. Oh, they're all coming in quick, uh, like you wouldn't believe. Uh, thanks, Don. 40 over 9, that's a good, uh, a good report. 80 metres must be churning along at the moment. And Andrew, too. G'day, Andrew. Mr. K-I-S. Uh, okay, so like I say, vk3ekh at gmail.com for uh, signal reports and the like. And we have a Discord channel uh, that's running. Uh, so those who know how to get onto our Discord uh, uh, chat window, uh, it's up and running and I can see Nebs is there, Cassiopeia. Uh, yes, there is uh, YouTube. It's running right now as I speak and uh, I believe the internet is being behaving good because I haven't had any dropouts at all uh, for the majority of this week. In fact, I'm, I've already forgotten when the last time it dropped out. So it looks like the NBN uh, people have uh, done something constructive. Um, I did politely threaten them on the phone <laughs> a week ago that I'd, I I felt it was a little bit unacceptable. That was the, uh, the harsh word that I used. Um... G'day Richard, VK3VRS, we're on uh, that 23 channel, and um, Dave, <laughs> and g'day Dave, Mr. Uh, MBO, the man, the man from MBO, 
Uh, Cassie up here again. Uh, G'day, Remus. And Martin, VK7JAH, are all joining there on the chat window and not listening to me as I oh, saw you. That's all right. All righty then. Um, yeah, look, there's a few interesting little things I've just spent the last 45 minutes uh, finding. And um, uh, I've tried to make sure that the uh, articles aren't laborious in length. So um, hopefully they'll be of some value to the listenership out there. Um, just to give you a very brief rundown of what I'm going to try and squeeze in in this hour uh, apart from a, a quick uh, rundown on the Astronomical Society uh, a, a very brief uh, overview of the uh, Sky Notes for June and uh, astronomers have de detected two major targets with a single telescope, a mysterious signal and its source galaxy uh, repeated signals from the center of the Milky Way could be aliens saying hello, a new study claims. And James Webb Space Telescope discovers 717 ancient galaxies that flooded the universe with first light. And something about Betelgeuse. And uh, if I can squeeze it in, it's just a very quick uh, three minute uh, read. Uh, Boeing is sued for allegedly stealing intellectual property related to NASA's Artemis Moon rocket. There it is. And a couple of space weather articles there too, which I thought was interesting. But somewhere in there will be Timotha, Timotha Scove's uh, space weather report, which is up till Sunday. So it's fairly current. All right. The Astronomical Society of Victoria, of which this is uh, on behalf of, um, was founded in 1922, comprises well over 1,600 members scattered about the country. Membership of the society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy and the objectives of the society is to, to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide um, uh, the facilities for furthering that study amongst the membership. Uh, monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month which is coming up, and meetings start right on the noggin at 8pm at the Mulia Hall, National Herbarium in Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, and is not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue and associated streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. The meetings uh, usually aim to finish at about 10 o'clock. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the library, extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory in the old astronomer's office. Receipt of the ASV magazine called Crux, containing articles, news, observing notes and the like. And there's a free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook, which is a yearly publication uh, put together and edited uh, by the Astronomical Society. It's almost like an almanac of sorts. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings, weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor, which is managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members too. The society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loans so members can try before they might decide to buy. Members are also encouraged to make use of the society's country property located near Heathcote some 90 minute drive from Melbourne there are a range of instruments available for members to use, the larger two with appropriate training, which range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on the site is a fully steerable 8.5 metre radio telescope, a Kennedy dish, which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section and a very pleasant good evening to any radio astronomers that are listening. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers which have an interest to do the same thing. 
instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society and there are 21 sections now that make up those various activity groups and I'll, this time I'll, I'll run through them. You can find those sections on the website under sections. The website's still going through a few little headaches here and there but we do have a new look for the ASV website and some things are still in the process of, um, of uh, completing but for those 21 sections that I mentioned in alphabetical order you've got astrophotography probably the biggest section out of the whole lot astrophotography club section comet and meteor section computing section Cosmology and Astrophysics, Deep Sky, Historical Section, Instrument Making, Juniors, Lunar and Planetary, New Astronomers Group, Radio Astronomy, Solar Astronomy, Space Exploration, and a new section uh, made just a few months ago called Women in the ASV. So if any of those sections have some value or some interest to you, you're more than welcome to get in contact with the section director for those uh, particular section of interest and uh, you'll be more than welcome to pop along to a, a Zoom meeting or an actual meeting at the, uh, the new club room which is now part of the Melbourne Observatory and um, you can make a decision as to whether you want to continue um, coming along and uh, perhaps coming a member of the ASV. Having said that, <laughs> I've got someone talking to me on the mobile phone. He's uh, there's Bob VK three A Z N, a friend of mine. He's uh, completely forgotten that I'm doing the broadcast right now, and he's just decided to call me on WhatsApp. Actually, is it WhatsApp? Uh, Zello. That's what it's called. Uh, an app called Zello. It uh, uses a mobile phone as a, like a two-way uh, audio thing. He's, he's just called me then. I'll just have to get back to him a little later. He should be aware that I'm on the Friday night. <laughs> anyway, so if any of those sections are uh, of any value, yeah, by all means. Uh, so, uh, please note that the ASC will conform to all government directives. Uh, in case things uh, uh, occur that require us to isolate or the place gets locked down again, which I somehow don't think will ever happen again. Uh, ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved and postponed. If you wish to write to the ASV, uh, the, you can use this address, the Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, P.O. Box, G, that is to say, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. Otherwise, go to the website, as mentioned before, www.asv.org.au, www.asv.org.au, and all will be revealed. Alrighty then. G'day, Greg. He's just sent me an email. Um... It's another call sign you've got there. <laughs> How does that work out? Um, how many call signs do you have, Greg? <laughs> anyway, he's operating from Warrenable. Uh, Dex, yeah. And there's the VCL factor. <laughs> G'day, Wayne. Um, and that's it at the moment. All right, enough of that. Thanks, guys, for tuning in and listening. Um... No, and stop the umming, Clint. I've got to learn to stop umming. I'm on a new diet, something called keto, K-E-T-O. So I'm, I'm in the process of getting used to that. I felt that it was worthwhile trying something different than the OptiFast diet that I normally hit. So with keto, K-E-T-O, you uh, just about only eat meat. And I think uh, I can handle that, <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, but I've just started this week, more or less, and... Um, giving up anything that's got sugar in it all right uh next on the line a little bit of uh, just a whoops wrong mouse um let's skim over the sky notes for june 2023 
I know I went into detail with them last week, so I'm just going to do a, uh, a, nut down, a nutshelled version of it. Uh, it is the winter solstice this month in the Southern Hemisphere, which is going to occur on the 22nd. Um, on the 22nd, the sun rises and sets at its most northerly points on the horizon. Its path crosses the sky uh, at its lowest and shortest, giving us our shortest day of the year. The sun rays reach the ground at their shallowest angle, hence the long shadows, and provide at least the least solar energy per square meter. Uh, so solstices and equinoxes result from the Earth's rotational axis being tilted at an angle of 23.5 degrees from its orbit around the Sun. Now, sunrise times. On Sunday the 11th, this weekend, the Sun will rise at 10, sorry, at 7.31 a.m., uh, this Sunday, 7.31 a.m., setting at 5.07 p.m., so we have a day of 9 hours and 35 minutes. Then on Wednesday the 21st, the sun will rise at 7.36 and set at 5.08. And by the end of the month, Friday the 30th, the sun will rise at 7.36 a.m., setting at 5.11 p.m., with the day being 9 hours and 34 minutes long. Phases of the moon uh, on Sunday the 11th will be a third quarter. On Sunday the 18th will be a new moon. And on Monday the 26th it will be a first quarter. And... Yeah, won't worry about that. Uh, Mercury rises in the east from 5.30 a.m. early in the month and by 6 a.m. mid-month it is moving closer to the sun and by late June it will no longer be visible. So as I've always said there are a number of times throughout the year that you can actually see the planet Mercury despite the fact that it is fairly close to the sun. But in relation to the Earth's position and the planet Mercury's position around the sun it is possible to see uh, Mercury either before sunrise or before sunset or just after sunset. Uh, Venus is the evening star, continues to be visible from 5.30 p.m. in the west before setting around 8.30 p.m. Uh, it has reached its greatest elongation or angular distance from the sun and will now be seen progressively lower each evening. Uh, Mars, the red planet, remains in the northwest from 5.50 p.m. before setting around 9 p.m. this month. It is currently 295 million kilometers from Earth, uh, but not as bright compared to when closest to Earth at 54.6 million kilometers, which occurs every two years. Jupiter is a bright early morning planet this month, rising in the east after 4 a.m. Uh, Saturn, with its yellowish tinge, rises around midnight early in the month and earlier each night before reaching its highest elevation in the north at 5.30 a.m., after which the ring planet is lost before dawn. Meteors. There are minor and there sorry there are minor meteor showers this month called uh, centered in Scorpius constellation Scorpius Sagittarius and the Butids can also appear from very late June into early July although low in number less than t 10 per hour they can often be spectacular and bright with many displaying a yellow orange color the best time to see meteors is after midnight with no moon in the night sky. There's also another meteor shower, in the, which is uh, the, the main radiant, is in the constellation of Aries. So if you know where to look for Aries, that's, the, that's roughly the uh, where the radiant is for these meteors. It's called Aritid, Aritid Meteor Shower. Aritid, Aritid, I think that's how you pronounce it. It occurs through... To June 24, but peaks on June 11. So 
um, this Sunday is the peak for this constellation for this particular meteor shower. So, um, meteor scatter enthusiasts, be aware that Sunday is probably a good time to look at um, uh, an increase in meteor burn activity um, and or um, meteor scatter as far as uh, reflecting your signal off the ionized trail left by a meteor. Good fun, that is. All right. Uh, I won't worry about that. Won't worry about that. Uh... What's the date today? No, those two dates are gone. Um, don't worry, you won't worry about that. If you're interested in looking for passings or crossings of the International Space Station, uh, I would suggest heavensabove.com, the website heavens-above.com, but basically just type in heavensabove.com, uh, and it is a magnificent little website. Um, it's, uh, it covers pretty much uh, all celestial objects, including uh, satellites orbiting Earth, and uh, you can put in your latitude and longitude location, and uh, the predictions will be fairly accurate. So, heavensabove.com if you're not aware of that. All right, this is what I left out last week. Uh, coffee with a dollop of cream replaces the sugar so I've had no sugar usually I have a maybe one teaspoon of sugar but I've had no sugar in my coffee all this week and uh, I've been I was told that it's cream um, pure cream cream is uh, good enough uh, on this day uh, a few days ago but on this day the first of June 2022, Czech Republic becomes the first country to ban light pollution. That's the 1st of June 2022. Czech Republic becomes the first country to ban light pollution. Interesting. On the 2nd of June 1966, Surveyor 1 reaches the moon as first probe to land on another body. Hmm... On the 3rd of June 1965, Ed White takes America's first space walk as part of the Gemini 4 program. On June 6, 1971, Soyuz 2 carries the first people into space station, Soyuz, Soylent 1 and Soylent 2. On the 7th of June 1879, uh, Jean Vaut, how do you pronounce that? Jean, Jean. Joan, John Vote, V O U T, proves with parallax that dwarf star Proxima Centauri is the same distance as Alpha Centauri binary. John Voigt. Um, on the 8th of June 2004, a transit of Venus is observed, the first in 122 years. On the 9th of June 1986, Rogers' report on Space Shuttle Challenger explosion reveals solid rocket booster fault and serious management and safety problems with the US program. Rogers' report, they call that. On the 10th of June 2003, launch of Mars Exploration Rover Spirit which lands in 2004 and exceeds expectations operating to 2010. On the 13th of June 1983, Pioneer 10 becomes the first spacecraft to travel beyond the planets of the solar system. On the 13th of June 1983, Hayabusa, or Busha, Hayabusa, Japan, Craft returns the first asteroid samples to Earth. Hiya, hiya on the 14th of June 1962, European Space Research Organization begins, later to be part of the European Space Agency, ESA, 1962. And I'll bring one more, a couple of more dates. On the 15th, of June in the year 763 BCE, 763 BCE, the 
Isirians, Isirians record a total solar eclipse which helps date other events in the Mesopotamian history. You have to read up about that. And the last one here I'll throw in, the 16th of June 1911, a meteorite weighing 772 grams strikes a barn in rural Wisconsin, USA. Hell, I'm, I'm in a barn and so far I've been pretty right. <laughs> but I often wonder about that, having a meteor come through our corrugated tin roof at three o'clock in the morning. Might just happen, you never know. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, VK3 EKH. Okay, first article. Astronomers detected two major targets with a single telescope, a mysterious signal and its source galaxy, published May 30. Astronomers have been working to better understand the galactic environments of fast radio bursts, FRBs, which are intense momentary bursts of energy occurring in mere milliseconds and with unknown cosmic origins. Now, a study of the slow-moving star-forming gas in the same galaxy found to host an FRB has been published in Astrophysical Journal. This is only the fourth ever publication on two completely different areas of astronomy describing the same galaxy. Even more remarkable is the fact that a single telescope made the possible discovery, sorry, the discovery possible uh, from the same observation. And for those watching the video, I do have a picture here of the radio telescope in question, or at least one of them. There it is. Bring it up. Okay. So, FRBs first detected in 2007 are incredibly powerful pulses of radio waves. They originate from distant galaxies and the signal typically only lasts a few milliseconds. FRBs are immensely useful for studying the cosmos, from investigating the matter that makes up the universe, to even using them to, constri cons to constrain the Hubble constant. The measure of how much the universe is expanding. However, the origin of FRBs is an ongoing puzzle for astronomers. Some FRBs are known to repeat, sometimes over a thousand times. Others have only been detected once. Whether these repeating or non-repeating signals have formed differently is currently being investigated by several research groups. At one point, we had more theories on how fast radio bursts are made than detections of them. It's an exciting time to be studying FRBs as showcased by the recent study associating an FRB with a gravitational wave. If that finding holds true, it means at least some FRBs could be created by two neutron stars merging to form a black hole. However, it is hard to pinpoint where exactly fast radio bursts come from. They are extremely bright, yet so brief. Getting an accurate position is hard for many radio telescopes. Without knowing where precisely these bursts originate, we cannot study the galaxies they are found in and without knowing the environments FRBs are formed in, we cannot fully solve their mysteries. One telescope in Australia is now helping us to figure this out. And that's what's on the picture there. The CSIRO's ASCAP radio telescope, ASKAP, ASCAP, which is Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, located in Western Australian desert, is a remarkable instrument made up of an array of 36 dishes separated by up to 6 kilometres. ASCAP can detect FRBs and pinpoint them to the host galaxies. ASCAP can in fact perform its FRB search at the same time as observations for other science surveys. 
One such ASCAP survey will map the star-forming gas in galaxies across the southern sky, helping us understand how galaxies evolve. During a recent observation for this study, ASCAP also detected a new FRB, and we were able to identify the galaxy it comes from, a nearby spiral galaxy much like our own Milky Way. ASCAP was able to find the cold neutral hydrogen gas, the source of star formation. In this spiral galaxy, as far as FRB host galaxies go, this is already a, <clears throat> this is already a detection of this galaxy. Only three other cases have been published so far. These had required follow-up observations or relied on other older observations made with different telescopes. Here, ASCAP gave us both the FRB and the gas surrounding it. It is the first simultaneous detection of these rare overlapping occurrences and I've got an image here of that. So I shall just bring up this little sky map. There she blues. So there, ASCAP both found, in this map here you see, both ASCAP, ASCAP both found the cold hydrogen gas, which is the white contours, in this spiral galaxy and pinpointed the FRB near the centre, which is the location given by a red eclipse. Very hard to see, but it is there. So, again, the white contours in this map is the cold hydrogen gas in this particular spiral galaxy. But the FRB, which is in the centre uh, of the eclipse, is, uh, is located right... It's right in the centre, nevertheless. I don't know whether you can pick it up. I'm just looking on the, on the TV repeat, and you can see it. It's basically a little red dot in the middle of that, uh, that spiral galaxy, which is where the FRB was. And I suspect that the circle that you're seeing in the bottom left-hand corner there is the uh, resolution of the telescope um, that's uh, imaged this. You're tuned to ASC. <coughs> nearly choked. You're tuned to ASC Radio VK3 EKH. Continuing on until out finished. Disturbed gas, which a which ASCAP can detect can give us an indication that a galaxy merger recently happened, which tells us about the star-forming history of the galaxy. In turn, this gives us clues as to what may cause FRBs. The previous study of gas surrounding FRBs found fast radio bursts reside in very dynamic systems, suggesting, uh, uh, suggesting galaxy mergers triggered uh, the bursts. For this particular FRB, however, the most, the, sorry, the host galaxy environment is surprisingly calm. Further studies will be needed to find out if the overall we see disturbed gas environments for FRBs or if there are distinct scenarios and potentially multiple creational creation paths or FRBs. So there's more to come, ladies and gentlemen. Given the uniqueness of such dual detections, this result showcases the strength and versatility of ASCAP. This is the first simultaneous detection of both an FRB and the gas its host galaxy. And this is just a start. ASCAP is set to detect and localise over 100 FRBs a year. By continuing to work in collaboratively with other different survey groups, uh, we um, will be able to untangle the mysteries behind FRBs and how they form and the host galaxy environments. Yes, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3, Echo Kilo Hotel. Okay, time is 10.35. How quick this hour is going. The next thing I want to talk about, uh, which was published one day ago, Just checking my uh, media on the other computer there. <coughs> Courtesy of space.com. Uh, <coughs> repeated signals from the center of the Milky Way could be aliens saying hello, a new study claims. And there's a little computer, not a computer, there's a little graphic here 
that I shall bring up as part of this article. Uh, there it is. And we're still streaming. A new search for extraterrestrial life has scientists looking inward toward the center of our galaxy. And what you're seeing there on the screen right now is a hypothet hypothetical, 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 that's a word, hypothetical alien craft transmits radio signals into space. Scientists are on the hunt for signals like these. <laughs> oh, well. Could intelligent aliens be lurking at the heart of the Milky Way, you may ask? A new search for extraterrestrial life aims to find out if listening to for, for radio pulses from the centre of our galaxy. Narrow frequency pulses are naturally emitted by stars called pulsars, but they're also used deliberately by humans in technology such as radar. Because these pulses stand out against the background radio noise of space, they're, they are an effective way of communicating across long distances and an appealing target to listen for when searching for alien civilizations. Scientists described the alien hunting strategy in a new study published May 30 in the Astronomical Journal. Researchers led by Cornell University graduate student Ashke Surich developed software to detect these repetitive, repetitive frequency patterns and tested it on known pulses to be sure it could pick up the narrow frequencies. These frequency ranges are very small, at about a tenth of the width of frequencies used by typical FM radio stations. The researchers then searched data from the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia using this method. Until now, Radio SETI has primarily detected dedicated its efforts to the search for continuous signals. Study co-author Vishal Gajar of the SETI Institute, a non-profit organization dedicated to the search for intelligent life in the universe, said in a statement, Our studies shed light on remarkable energy efficiency of a train of pulses as a means of interstellar communication across vast distances. Notably, this study marks the first ever comprehensive endeavour to conduct in-depth searches for these signals. The researchers are listening in to the middle of the Milky Way because it is dense with stars and potentially habitable exoplanets. What's more, if intelligent aliens at the core of the Milky Way want wanted to reach out to the rest of the galaxy, they could send signals sweeping across a wide range of planets given their privileged position at the centre of the galaxy. Using narrow bandwidths and repeated patterns would be a prime way for aliens to reveal themselves, as such a combination is extremely unlikely to occur naturally. Study co-author Steve Croft a project scientist with Breakthrough Listen program said in a separate statement. The method uses an algorithm that can search through 1.5 million telescope data samples in 30 minutes. Though researchers did not find any telltale signs in their first search, they say that the speed of the algorithm will help improve searches in the future. Breakthrough Listen captures huge volumes of data and Ashkay's technique provides a new method to help us search the haystack for needles that could provide tantalizing evidence of, 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 of advanced extraterrestrial life forms, Croft said. Always interested in that uh, subject. All right, next subject. <laughs> Where am I? Here I am. Uh, James Webb. Alrighty then, let me have another squig of coffee. Testing one, two, three. <clears throat> the James Webb Space Telescope discovers 717, 717 ancient galaxies that flooded the universe with first light. This was published 15 hours ago. 93% of newfound galaxies that Webb spotted have never been seen before and I can show you a picture of this. Cast your eyes on this image if I can find it. Um, oh 
did I put it there or did I not? There's always one image that I don't put there. Uh, image, browse, pictures, there it is. Why didn't I transfer that across? I tell you, I don't know. Here it is, ladies and gents. Fairly unassuming, but it's significant. <laughs> All right, so what you're seeing there is... <clears throat> This infrared image from NASA's James Webb Space Telescope shows a portion of an area of the sky known as Goods South. G O O D S. Goods South. There's more than 45,000 galaxies are visible here. The James Webb Telescope, J W S T, or Webb, has unveiled hundreds of ancient galaxies that could be among the first members of the universe, a leap from a leap from only a handful that were previously known to exist at the time. As early as 600 million years after the Big Bang, pardon me, these very young galaxies flaunted complex structures and clusters of star formation, a new study reports. The study is part of of a international collaboration called the JWST Advanced Deep Extra Galactic Survey or JADES which gathered a month's worth of observations from two tiny patches in the sky one in Ursa Minor constellation and another one in the direction of Fornix cluster. Within this region were over 700 newly discovered young galaxies that reveal that sorry, reveal with the cosmos looked like in its earliest. <clears throat> if you took the whole universe and shrunk it down to a two hour movie, you are seeing the first five minutes of the movie, Kevin Hayline said, an, in, a, a, an assistant research professor at Stewart Observatory in Arizona and lead author of the new study said that while announcing the discovery on Monday, June 5, at the 242nd meeting of the American Astronomical Society being held in Albuquerque and online, he said, these are the galaxies that are starting, to, starting the process of making the elements and the complexity that we see in the world around us today. These new findings shed light on how the first galaxies or stars are formed, creating the rich catalogue of elements observed in the universe today. Yes, I, I won't read the whole lot because it does actually go on for a bit. I'll just go to the last few paragraphs. The ultraviolet, oh, the, the ultraviolet starlight reionized the universe by splitting its abundant hydrogen atoms into protons and electrons, a process that lasted until one billion years after the Big Bang. However, a few astronomers say outflows from supermassive black holes, similar to the one that resides in the heart of our Milky Way, could have triggered the escape of ultraviolet radiation from galaxies and thus played an important role in cosmic evolution that previously thought. Now, a second team from the JADES program uh, that has been st studying galaxies that existed between 500 to 850 million years after the Big Bang, or between five to eight minutes of the two-hour movie described it, describing the universe, thinks it has an answer to the long-standing question. In this next scene of the universe, we are starting to actually see the impact of galaxy formation on the composition of large-scale universes. And the galaxies in the early universe were just far more chaotic in general in how they formed stars. In the team's study, the signs of star formation in those very early galaxies which provided insight into how starlight ionized the gas within those galaxies, the team found that one in six galaxies at the time showed extreme line emissions in galaxy spectra, a feature that atoms ionized by starlight radiate when they have cooled down and combined with other molecules. These, oh sorry, those emission lines are evidence that early galaxies were actively birthing stars, which then pumped torrents of ultraviolet protons into their respective galaxies. This way, 
the universe's early stars became the main drivers of cosmic reionization. These extreme emission lines are active, actually relatively common in, in, in the uh, very early universe. Uh, and um, almost every single galaxy that we are finding shows that unusually strong emission line signatures indicating intense recent star formation, uh, these early galaxies were very good at creating hot massive stars. And finally, from the same emission lines, the team, science team, also inferred that galaxies in the early universe birthed stars in short bursts followed by quiescent periods. All of a sudden, you would have tens of suns worth of solar masses being assembled at all at once in the early galaxies. <clears throat> yep. Okay, so if you want to catch up with the rest of that report, uh, it's space.com, look under astronomy, I think it is. James Webb Space Telescope discovers 717 ancient galaxies. And that image on the sky of the, on the, on the video there is uh, a, a, a picture of that. I don't really like breaking up a story like that because... Um, it uh, it sounds funny, and I was picking up on that because I was I was deliberately not mentioning people's names because it, it just didn't sound right. So apologies on that article. Anyway, uh, right, I might be able to squeeze in this next one before going to Timothy's report. Uh, where are we? Beetlejuice. Okay. Hmm, I might have to give this a shortcut too. Um, this was published two days ago. <clears throat> Beetlejuice, a guide to the giant stars sparking supernova hopes. When Beetlejuice explodes in, in a supernova, it will shine as bright as the full moon in our sky. Well, that'll be something to see. And I've got a picture here of, uh, of Beetlejuice. Um, as it is at the moment. Betelgeuse is one of the brightest stars in the night sky and also one of the largest stars known to astronomers. Forming the left shoulder of the Orion constellation, Betelgeuse is a so-called red giant, a star in the final stages of its life, which sometimes prompts speculations that it might soon explode in a supernova. Located some 650 light years from Earth, Betelgeuse, also known as Alpha Ironis, Ironis, usually ranks as the 10th brightest star in the night sky. The star, however, is known for its periodic dimming and brightening up, which is sometimes makes its claim a bit up and down with the ranking. Astronomers think that Betelgeuse is only 10 million years old, and uh, that's 50 times younger than our sun. Despite its relatively young age, Betelgeuse has already run out of hydrogen fuel in its core and is now in the final red giant stage of its life, which is fusing helium to carbon. The reason for Betelgeuse's fast-paced life is the fact that it was likely born very massive. According to Science Alert, Betelgeuse used used to be a white, a blue-white O-type star, the most massive kind of a main sequence hydrogen-burning star. The bigger the star, the brighter it shines, and the hotter it burns. But also, the faster it runs out of its hydrogen, and sooner it turns into a red giant. In its prime, Betelgeuse must have been tens of time tens of times more massive than our sun and tens to hundreds of times more luminous. Temperatures on its surface may have reached up to a mind-boggling 50,000 degrees Celsius compared to the sun's lukewarm uh, at 5,500 degrees Celsius. After Betelgeuse exhausted its hydrogen and began burning helium, its envelope expanded far beyond its original size. Today, 
Betelgeuse is one of the largest known stars, measuring more than 700 million miles or 1.2 billion kilometers in diameter. If Betelgeuse were to replace the Sun at the, at the center of our solar system, it would reach all the way to Jupiter. On the other hand, the star is no longer anywhere near as hot as it used to be at 5,800 degrees Fahrenheit or 3,300 degrees Celsius, Betelgeuse's surface is now cooler than that of the Sun. Still, the star shines 7,500 to 14,000 times brighter than our star. Now, there's a bit more to that article, but uh, I haven't got time to read that out. But if you want to catch up with that one, Betelgeuse, a guide to a giant star sparking supernova hopes, uh, go to space.com. And now <laughs> I shall go across to our space weather woman. Let me just get that set up. Uh, there she is. And hopefully I'll have all the audio sorted out. So we should be able to run with that at, at the flick of a switch. Stand by for our space weather woman's solar report. We have an Earth directed solar storm that's going to sideswipe Earth. And. Some more flare activity is on the way. The stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Our sun finally picks up in activity this week as we take a look at our Earth-facing disk. We do have a lot of regions in Earth view, but we'll get back to those in a minute. Meanwhile, take a look at this big coronal hole that's been rotating in through the Earth strike zone. It's been sending us a little bit of fast wind, but that's not all that much news. If you take a look just to the east of that, however, do you see that big long filament? We've been following this filament all the way across the Earth-facing disk. We were thinking, it gave us a couple of false starts. We we're thinking it was going to launch, but finally, on the 4th, watch it there, whoosh! Do you see that? It looks like it's going to go west of Earth mainly, but because we have the fast wind from this coronal hole that's just to the west of that, it may actually deflect this uh, solar storm into the path of Earth. So we could get a glancing blow sometime around the 7th. That's what the NASA models look like, but it's kind of hard to tell. We'll talk more about that later. Meanwhile, as we take a look at a couple of the regions in the south, we've got region 3323 and 3327. These are big flare players, and we are watching them right now to see whether or not they're going to start really ramping up activity. Meanwhile, that solar flux is going to ramp up, and we've got more regions on the sun's far side that have yet to rotate into view, so it looks like finally we're going to have some chances for aurora and possibly big flares. Switching to our M flare and radio blackout threat meter, as we take a look at the X-ray flux over the last week, we really haven't been getting that much activity. We have popped a couple big M-class flares back on June 1st and on June 2nd, but since then things have pretty much quieted down. You might have noticed oh, there's a lot less noise on the bands over the past few days, but this is not going to last. Radio blackouts are going to start coming back because we are having Big flare players rotate back into Earth view and expect that noise floor to ramp up and the solar flux also to ramp up near the end of the week. So amateur radio operators, just get ready. On Earth's day side, it's going to be a bit more lively. Switching to our solar storm conditions, over the past week, things have been reasonably quiet. We've been hovering between unsettled conditions to even quiet conditions at times. We have bumped up a couple times to active conditions for just a short while. One of them was back on June 1st, and this was basically due to some fast solar wind that really wasn't all that fast or all that effective. So Aurora at high latitudes was kind of the name of the game, but nothing really down at mid latitudes. In fact, as we got this last little bump up from some fast solar wind from 
from this coronal hole that's been passing through the Earth strike zone now? Well, again, we've only had a tiny bit of active conditions which brings aurora to high latitudes, but mid-latitude aurora photographers, you've been kind of having to do without. However, you might get a chance here with this glancing blow from the solar storm, not expecting all that much, but it could bump us up to active conditions, possibly minor storm conditions, if that fast wind blows this thing and deflects it more into Earth view, but we're just going to have to wait and see. Now, taking a closer look at that solar storm that was launched back on the 4th, we switched to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NASA's version of the model, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we take a look at that solar storm being launched, you can see it's launching off to the west, but it does look like it could clip Earth about midday on the 7th. We're not expecting a really impressive blow, but it could be enough to give us a little bit of aurora, especially at high latitudes and possibly a chance down at mid-latitudes. Now, also, if that fast solar wind from that coronal hole ends up deflecting the structure further into Earth, it could be a bigger blow than what we might have expected. So it's going to be kind of hard to tell, but Aurora photographers, if you're dedicated, you might actually get a chance for some more Aurora starting on the 7th. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our partially far-sighted monitor. You can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a tiny bit from the side. And when we take a look at the view from Stereo A, you can see in the west that long filament, and you can actually watch it erupt slowly. That is the filament that actually launched that solar storm that looks like it's going to go west of Earth, but may graze us but right around the 7th. So that should get you oriented. And if you look past that to the east, you can see uh, two big bands, both in the north and in the south. These are a lot of active regions that are going to be rotating into view. In fact, when we take a look at the HMI helioseismology far side viewer, we can see a lot of dark regions, especially in the north. These are regions that look like they're going to be rotating into view here in about four days or so, and that could bring some real activity, including big flares and possibly more solar storm chances in the future. So next week, things in terms of activity could really ramp up. Switching to our moon and meteors, we are now coming out of our strawberry moon on our way to a third quarter, and by the 11th, the moon will be about 63% illuminated. So, Unite Sky Watchers, if you want to catch some aurora or some dim objects in the sky, well, you're going to have this bright companion, so you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that Earth-directed solar storm that's going to give us a glancing blow starting around midday on the 7th. So at high latitudes, NOAA's expecting minor storm conditions, but we have up to about a 20% chance of a major storm. Now, activity could easily start right at, like I said, midday on the 7th, and we could ramp up to about the 8th and then have aurora clear in through the 9th before things begin to settle down. So at high latitudes, it should be a good show. Now at mid-latitudes, however, NOAA's only expecting unsettled conditions, but we do have up to about a 10% chance of a minor storm. Again, the main time will be right around the 8th, but things should not last nearly as long. So aurora photographers, if you're at mid-latitudes, well, only if you're dedicated should you bother to chase. Switching to your solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week. Well, we do have quite a few active regions in Earth view, and that is boosting that solar flux. We are sitting in the 160s to 170s range, and this means good radio propagation on Earth's day side. The sad thing is that we do have moderate noise on the bands right now. In fact, NOAA is giving us about a 30% chance of M-class flares at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and as well as a 10% chance of X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout, and these conditions will easily extend through the rest of the five days here and possibly into next week because we have even more big flare players that are going to rotate into Earth view. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you're going to have to deal with periodic disruptions on Earth's day side on the bands with these radio blackouts, and if you are a GPS user, just understand, especially near dawn and near dusk, anywhere in that region, you can get GPS disruptions as well from these radio blackouts. 
Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Well, we do have some flare activity this week, and that does mean that we are on alert when it comes to radiation storms. The good thing is, however, that we don't have any active radiation storms right now. In fact, we're sitting at the D1 normal range, and that is really where we should continue to be over the course of this week. We are having quiet conditions at the S0 level, so that is not a problem for any of you frequent flyers. However, because of the activity, NOAA is giving us about a 10% chance of an S1 to S2 level radio uh, uh solar radiation storm. So if you are a pilot, be sure to check those ICAO advisories quite often. And if you are a drone pilot, be aware that there are radiation storms that could affect you if you happen to be crossing through the poles. So the space weather this week is definitely picking up in activity. We do have a partly Earth-directed solar storm that looks to graze Earth to the west about midday on the 7th. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a show. Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, only if you're dedicated should you chase. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, while we do have a couple big flare players in Earth view, these are regions 3323 and 3327, and these regions are uh, have, do have big flare potential, so we could be seeing more radio blackouts here over this next week, but with moderate noise on the bands, at least your radio propagation is staying in the good range because solar flux continues to be high. And now GPS users, well, you know, things aren't too bad for you. We have some radio blackouts that could give you some issues, especially near dawn and near dusk. And we also have a little bit of aurora, but that aurora should kind of stay up at high latitudes. So overall, things should be pretty good. But this week, you definitely need to stay vigilant. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Okay, thanks, Timotha. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Just a little bit more audio there. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, this is uh, your tune to uh, ASV Radio. Um, leave the microphone alone, Clint. <laughs> uh, VK3 uh, Echo Kilo Hotel, and I think I've got the levels right there. And uh, I'm not. Uh, uh, probably a little bit more level there on the vmix one two three four five yep i just want to make sure that i don't go into the red on vmix because uh it does have a tendency to um to, to distort the uh, youtube uh, feed and i think i've got that right level all right uh thanks timotha for her uh, space weather report and um note that it's already uh, gone over 11 o'clock there so i'll just go quickly into uh into the space weather uh, report here. Uh, actually, I'll uh, hang on. Just mucking around with headphones here. Oh, right, taking the headphones off. Um, leave the microphone alone, Clint. <laughs> Keep playing with the microphone. Um, okay, spaceweather.com. The solar wind is currently at 340 kilometers a second at a density of 9.57 protons per cubic centimeter. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I think I can count there. Uh, 10 sunspots on the disk of the sun as we speak, which I can bring up on the visions. There it is. Uh, so that is the current uh, disk of the sun. So the sunspot number is currently at 147. The radio sun uh, solar flux measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters is 162 solar flux units. Uh, the KP index, which is somewhere here, I've just gone past it, there it is. The planetary K index uh, is now equal to 1, which is considered quiet. The 24-hour max KP figure is 1.67, which is also considered quiet. As far as the aurora over Antarctica is concerned, it is very, very non-existent at the moment. Well, there is something there. I'll bring that up as well. There it is. That's the, the current uh, solar uh, so, uh, the uh, Southern Aurora, um, Australis, over Antarctica. So it's very vague at the moment, nothing to write home about. Uh, now, just a very quick look at what uh, is featured in spaceweather.com uh, 
at the moment. Um, it reports that, as Timotha was just saying, uh, the minor geomagnetic storm watch, uh, is, which has been updated, uh, NOAA forecasters say that there that a minor G1 class geomagnetic storms are possible on June 3, uh, when a stream of solar wind is expected. Hang on a sec. Where am I reading? Oh my goodness me. Sorry about that, ladies and gents. I'm looking at an old uh, spaceweather.com report. Oh, my goodness gracious me. I, I know why I did that, because I, I, I've got two space weather pages open, because I was going to read an article about the thermosphere is heating up. That's why I've got that opened up. Just briefly, before I go into the uh, this day's report, <laughs> I don't care if I go over time, um... Um, 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 I won't just ignore that last minor geomagnetic storm watch updated. That's old news. But what I wanted to to uh, mention, um, which was an interesting article in spaceweather.com, the thermosphere is heating up. If you're a satellite, the story is important. A series of geomagnetic a series of geomagnetic storms in 2023 has pumped terawatts of energy into Earth's upper atmosphere, helping to push its temperature and height to a 20-year high. Air surrounding our planet is now touching satellites in Earth orbit and dragging them down. Blame the sun, says Martin Malinchek of NASA's Langley, Langley, Langley. Increasing solar activity is heating the top of the atmosphere. The extra heat has no effect on weather or climate at Earth's surface, but it's a big deal for satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, Martin uh, says that uh, as an expert on the temperature up there, for 20 years he has been using the SABER instrument, S-A-B-E-R, on NASA's timed satellite to monitor infrared emissions from the thermosphere, the uppermost layer of the atmosphere. Right now, uh, we're seeing some of the highest readings in the mission's 21.5 year history, he says. The thermosphere is exquisitely sensitive to solar activity, um, readily absorbing energy from solar flares and geomagnetic storms. These storms have been coming hard and fast with recent rise of solar cycle 25. Uh, there have been five significant geomagnetic storms in calendar year 2023 that resulted in marked increases in the amount of infrared radiation in the Earth's atmosphere, Malinjic said. Uh, they peaked on January the 15th uh, at 0.59 terawatts, February 16 at 0.62 terawatts, February 27.78 terawatts, March 24 at 1.04 terawatts and April 24 uh, at 1.02 terawatts. And uh, she goes on to say that the um, uh, the sensor uh, that detects these this heat, extra heat, obtains these numbers by measuring infrared radiation emitted from nitric oxide and carbon dioxide molecules in the thermosphere. And there is a little graph here, for those watching the video side of things, there's a little graph that's associated with this article. Um, it, the, uh, the article, the, this, this particular graph shows daily thermosphere climax, sorry, <laughs> NASA's daily thermosphere climate index tracks thermal energy in Earth's upper atmosphere. So far, solar cycle 25 is far ahead of cycle 24, as we can see in this chart on the screen, on my YouTube screen. Um, all right, I'll leave that there, um, and I'll go to today's current spaceweather.com. So starting briefly, starting at the top of this page, the solar wind is currently 276.2 kilometers a second at a density of 1.88 protons per cubic centimeter. There is what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight uh, uh, sunspots on the disk of the sun, and no, I don't have that. 
because it was the, lo- the wrong one. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have to take my word for it. Uh, the sunspot number is 149, and the current radio sun is at 169 solar flux units. The KP index uh, is uh, 1. KP is equal to 1, which is considered quiet. And the 24-hour max, the KP will be equal to 1.67, which is also still considered as quiet. Uh, Okay, well, there it is. Um, I don't think there's much else to report. There is a image here of the International Space Station uh, uh, doing a transit across the sun and I did save that little gift image which I'll bring up as well and there it is um, so the uh, the International Space Station sunspot transit it's uh, it's not easy to, to uh, catch the International Space Station when it passes in front of the sun uh, with the station moving faster than 28,000 kilometers an hour a typical transit lasts uh, less than a second and you have to be standing on a narrow patch of the earth less than 10 kilometers wide. The astrophotographer uh, just did something even more amazing. He placed himself in the transit line of the individual sunspot. So uh, there it is anyway uh, on the screen right now, the International Space Station zipping across the surface of the sun. (laughs) So it looks. It's uh, pretty amazing footage when you actually see that on the big screen here. All right, I'm going to scoot right down to asteroids. Potentially hazardous asteroids are space rocks larger than approximately 100 metres that can come closer to Earth than 0.05 AU. None of the known PHAs is on a collision course with our planet at the moment. Uh, but although astronomers are finding new ones all the time. As of June 9, 2023, there are 2,335 potentially hazardous asteroids. All right, you are tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast. We shall now conclude tonight's session Sorry for going over time again. Didn't think I would, but there it is. Um, a very pleasant good evening to everybody that joined on the chat window. I can see that Cassie O'Pierre left early. Uh, Richard, uh, Dave from uh, the MBO. Uh, Remus, who's also talking about the um, uh, wanting to know if anybody's going up to uh, uh, to Lake Torrell, um, Salt Lake, up in far. Victoria there. This this weekend the ASV uh, have got a, um, uh, a thing happening and uh, this is the second year uh, that the ASV has run this event. Uh, you can find out more information on the ASV website um, but it's uh, you pretty much have to book for this and it also uh, is members only sort of thing. Uh, but that's this weekend and uh, it's a long way to go Sea Lake Astro Fest public viewing night Saturday November the 4th um, what the heck is that um, it's something else okay so anyway it's Sea Lake Torral Astro Fest they're calling it they've combined two things in the one slide anyway I wish them all the best uh, whatever they might get up to and it's just a bit too far for my liking to travel so I, uh, I wish everybody a very pleasant weekend up there and it should be a good time given that the weather is going to be much better than it has been over the last few days. Uh, so there it is. Uh, thanks uh, to everybody who's uh, sent me emails and I must acknowledge a, um, a Graham Lee uh, VK6MIL who's uh, sent me a report. He's, uh, he, he was tuning the low end of the band and discovered the broadcast, first time he's heard it. And he says that he was just tuning around, heard the signal in Perth, first time I've heard you guys, and uh, (laughs) never knew what you were broadcasting. We've been broadcasting since 1988, Uh, so over 30 years of uh, of Friday night uh, broadcasting here, not all by me, but um, there it is. We don't have a QSL card, I've been meaning to, uh, to get a dedicated QSL card printed up. Uh, but uh, sorry Graham, we, we don't actually have a QSL card, 
but I am quite happy to receive your card. Uh, I've got a, actually I've got a few cards here that I've collected uh, over the years. Uh, so, uh, I, but I must really reciprocate and do something about that. Um, and uh, I, I can probably get that sorted through through the ASV rather than coming out of my own pocket. But that's another story. This is VK3 EKH concluding transmissions tonight. Thank you for very much for listening. I hope that some of the stories tonight were of some value and some interest. Right now, we shall open up the frequency to see if any stations are prepared to uh, to, to talk back. So, um, uh, this is VK... Just give me a second to get my headphones right. And uh, this is VK3... Um, EKH listening on uh, 3541 kilohertz. Uh, okay, I'm going to have to ask you guys to uh, repeat that. There are uh, there was a couple of doubles, but there was also um, fairly weak stations, <coughs> um, and uh, I'm just hoping that I, I was got the audio uh, set right so that I can feed that across to my YouTube channel. I've 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 got VK3SBX. That's about the <laughs> call sign I wrote down. So apart from you there, Steve, can I have just a, a quick call again of the stations that checked in? VK3, C, e, e, EKH, listening. Uh, VK3, Golf Lima. Uh, VK3, TJS. VK3, WAY. Uh, VK3, Bravo, Sugar Fox. Yeah, can I just have that last station again? Fairly weak. Try again. Yep, got you, Andrew. No problems at all. VK3 SPX, VK3 GL, VK3 TJS, VK3 WAY, VK3 BSF, and VK3 KIS. Any other stations? Okay, I think that was Martin at the end there. All right. Okay, to the top of the list. G'day, Steve. VK3 SPX, VK3 CSJ, EKH. Uh, VK3 EKH, this is VK3 SPX. Yeah, hi, Clint. Um, yeah, look, I was a bit lazy today. I, uh, I was working in the garage on my um, new antenna and, and then I had to change a tyre by the side of the road yesterday. It's all aches and pains today, so I listened to your broadcast lying flat on my back uh, <laughs> looking at YouTube on my phone. <laughs> so I didn't, uh, I didn't come up on Discord or send you an email uh, uh, report, but just your five at night plus 24 to work. <coughs> anyway, it was just hearing some things I thought. Um, I, I, I remember you mentioned the, you know, the things that happened on the day and what have you, and the transit of Venus came up, and I, I'm not sure it was the 2004 one or the maybe the later one. Um, I think you mentioned the 2004, but um, I did actually see that once, so I managed to project um, the sun on a door. Um, I think with a pair of binoculars. I can't remember how I did it now. But anyway, it made a little sun, um, you know, I'm probably only about five millimetres across on the door, but a cute little black dot crept across it, and I thought that was really cool, that, that the way that happened there. So I did witness that trend to the Venus. And, um, and Beetlejuice, yeah, it'd be good if it blew up right now, wouldn't it? That'd be great for us amateur astronomers. Um, it'd be really, uh, really interesting. Uh, but, uh, I did say I was probably waiting for Uh, 
Uh, no worries there. So, <clears throat> VK3 uh, SPX, VK3 EKH. Yes, it was the 8th of uh, June uh, 2004. Um, I do remember that it was a, um, a bit of a big deal and uh, there were people uh, uh, tripping in to get or going to all sorts of places I should say to uh, to set up their telescopes to be able to take uh, images and um, and whatnot of the uh, of the transit so uh, I do remember it, but but uh, I, I never looked through a telescope to, to see it by eye um, <clears throat> but um, anyway yes it was a it was certainly a, a one of those uh, times that uh, in astronomy that you uh, either take an interest in or you don't. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, on um, uh, having to change a tyre, I know what that's like. Uh, so <laughs> I think we all know what that's like. Um, I did that recently to my Subaru, so... Um, uh, and then ended up spending uh, money on getting a whole new set of tyres. I just wanted one tyre fixed, and of course they said, oh, no, I think all tyres need to be replaced, so bloody hell. Anyway, there it is. Um, if the signals aren't very good tonight. I, I, I can see that the uh, the conditions are a little bit uh, vulnerable here at the moment. Everybody seems to be just a little bit on the weak side. So uh, hopefully I'm, I'm getting through. Thanks, uh, um, Stephen. Uh, excellent stuff. VK3GL in Bunyip, VK3EKH. Yes, well, good evening there, Clint. VK3EKH and the, uh, and the group. Uh, who's checked in tonight, VK3GL. A yeah, pleasant good evening to everyone who's, uh, who's listening this evening. Um, and I think you're right there, Clint. I don't think the signals on the band are particularly flash tonight. Your, your broadcast signal's been quite OK, um, but for the last sort of, oh, I reckon the last 20 minutes or so, since about 11 o'clock, there's been um, quite a few times where you've had fairly deep fades on the signal which is uncharacteristic of your normal weekly broadcast. Anyway, I trust all is well. Uh, thanks very much for the information shared this evening. Um, I, uh, I listened to about the last half of it. Unfortunately, been pretty busy with work this evening and I'm sort of flying solo at the moment because um, uh, my offsider that I was working with is, um, uh, took off a couple of hours ago sick. So... Um, sort of holding the port a little bit. <laughs> anyway, um, nothing really much to add or comment on this, this evening. Just uh, enjoyed listening to the, the broadcast and the information shared once again. Thanks, Clint. VK3, EKH, uh, VK3GL in Bunyam. Yeah, thanks, Graeme. VK3GL, VK3EKH. Very good. Not a problem. Thanks for uh, checking in and uh, doing a little bit of listens there. And... Uh, <clears throat> and um, and also note uh, about the uh, uh, other work colleague as such. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll probably catch up uh, over the weekend, being a long weekend. There might be some uh, moment there we'll, uh, we'll cross paths, hopefully. So uh, all very good. Um, yes, indeed. Thanks, Graeme. Uh, across to Jack in Shepparton, VK3TJS, VK3EKH. G'day, Jack. No worries, Jack, VK3TJS in Shepparton, VK3EKH replying, very good indeed. Signal is up and down, um, 
you're um, averaging about strength at nine, which is just above my noise floor, uh, Jack. So uh, um, you were just hanging in there. <laughs> um, but um, yes, look, I think uh, no doubt uh, you uh, got a lot of rain uh, up that way too. It's uh, certainly uh, the the weather's done a lot of a lot of dump uh, over the uh, uh, northwest and central to. Uh, to the northeast part of Victoria these last couple of days, so um, there's lots of little flood warnings going out everywhere. Um, but hopefully that uh, it shouldn't be too bad. Anyway, thanks, Jack, for calling in. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, we have um, this is a strange call sign. Um, I'll have to explain. <laughs> VK3WAY. Maybe it's just because it forms a word. I don't know. Warrenable Men's Shed Radio Group. I see. The Warrenable Men's Shed Radio Group. Oh, you'll have to tell me about that one. VK3WAY. VK3EKH. Yeah, good on you, Clint. And, uh, yeah, that's correct. We are a radio group here in uh, up at uh, the Warrenable Men's Shed. And uh, the call sign VK is the call sign of VK. You're about 20 over there, Clint. I didn't have any issues with your signal at all, and all signals are good. Anyway, good evening to everybody. And uh, yeah, what, uh, what, how this eventuated there, Clint? Uh, my own station uh, in Warrnambool. I lost uh, during the week there. I, I lost uh, one leg of the antenna, so uh, I thought, oh well, I'll come up here and uh, activate. Um, Location for no noise, <laughs> certain, certainly different to what uh, I've have it, got at home. Whereas I've got five and nine or five and seven noise level. So anyway, there. Uh, what what is there? Well, there is about uh, 15 members of this uh, radio group, and uh, we come in uh, and join the wonderful men shed. As in men shed, and uh, we formed a radio group there. Uh, best locations in Warrnambool, it's got altitude, uh, a few commercial antennas on site, like Delta Office and some of the other towers, but uh, boy, is it uh, a very quiet location, so uh, uh, I didn't think it would be like that, we put up a HF antenna uh, oh, about a month or so, uh, yeah, be about a month ago, and uh, yeah, it's, it's working well, mate. Yeah, no worries, Greg. Is there, is there any members there, or are you just on your own? I'm solo there, uh, Clint. Solo, mate, over. Oh, that's no good. <laughs> How can you have a, a, a men's shed uh, when everybody's decided to uh, not show up? Uh, that's no good. Anyway, no worries, Greg. E- excellent stuff. VK3 VK3WAY, showing the way. This is VK3EKH with VK3CSJ on the microphone. And, of course, uh, Greg is also VK3Delta X-Ray. Yes, well, that's very, very interesting. Um, well, it, uh, certainly QRZ.com um, comes up with the uh, uh, the Warrenable Men's Shed Radio Group. And there's a picture in there somewhere. It's, it's got no pictures, so you need to, to uh, organise a, a photograph of the 15 blokes that uh, come into that men's shed <laughs> and stick it up on QRZ. Oh dear! Yeah, I can just imagine it. It sounds uh, it sounds like a delight. So uh, very good, Greg. Excellent stuff. Um, uh, I do envy your quiet RF zone. Um, I mean, my noise floor sits right on strength nine. 
and uh, it just makes things a pain when I, I yeah, get weak signals. So, you know, uh, 20 plus signals in, in an area that's uh, otherwise noiseless has got to be just a, a dream. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Thanks very much for coming up. Good on you, mate. Uh, I think it's Peter, VK3BSF. And if QRZ.com was right, you're uh, in Narry Warren. So uh, I've got no, no problems with your signal. <laughs> VK3, Bravo, Sierra Fox. This is VK3 EKH. Hey, Roger Clint to VK3 EKH, VK3BSF. Yes, you're a booming <laughs> 40 over. And uh, good, uh, good signal, steady, and great audio. Um, I like the broadcast. Poor old Beetle just looks like it's ending its life pretty soon. Uh, it looks like it, it is anyway, if it's expanding like that. Um, the the sunset pot girl took me by surprise. The audio <laughs> sort of jumped up a bit. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that. Um, but uh, all signals, I can read all signals. You don't have to get a better radio, Clint. If you're, my noise floor here is just about zero with this good old digital radio. It's a marvel of technology, the DX10. Um, so that's, that's the story there. Um, okay, put it back to you. Thanks for the broadcast, VK. Yeah, this is the second or third time I think I've uh, stumbled across a your uh, your frequency and uh, good info VK3 EKH VK3 BSF yeah thanks uh, Peter VK3 BSF VK3 EKH returning and uh, <clears throat> yeah it's definitely a good signal from you um, it's, uh, it's only measuring around 20 to 30 over <laughs> but uh, plenty uh, plenty good and uh, no problems with the quality DX10 I'm gonna oh, it sounds familiar gonna have to look that one up um, yeah, I, I use a Pro 3, an ICOM 756 Pro 3 here, and uh, a, a high old PR40 mic going through a little bit of EQ, um, and uh, and uh, because I the the video part of the broadcast there's there's the YouTube feed, so you can actually, <coughs> you can actually see uh, uh, what's going on here on my YouTube channel uh, live stream, although it's about 20 seconds lagging, um, but um, uh, we're also broadcasting via the Melbourne TV repeater, VK3R TV in full HD in, in real, near real time at least. <laughs> so there, there's the video sources for uh, the program here. And uh, yeah, like uh, like Graham over there in, in, in Perth, uh, uh, who's called in, um, uh, Mullaloo actually, a place called Mullaloo in uh, Western Australia, he sent me an email and uh, he's uh, he, first time he's heard the, the broadcast, um, and um, uh, he's also finding it a bit interesting. So, uh, <coughs> welcome, uh, Graham. And uh, and uh, yeah, the call sign's certainly familiar, uh, uh, Peter. So um, yeah, thanks for calling in. And uh, um, I've uh, um, I really should use this uh, uh, transceiver. I, I've got a an a, a, a NAN eight thousand. It's probably one of um, the, the second most expensive uh, radio that I've got in this uh, shack of mine, and uh, it, it's just horribly underutilized. So uh, I really, uh, I figure if I was to get that um, replace uh, replace the uh, um, the Pro Three uh, with the NAN eight thousand, I'd uh, I'd probably be doing a lot better in that uh, respect as far as noise reduction is concerned. It's an interesting thought, actually. So hmm, things that make you go hmm. Anyway, I'll think of that because it, it it sits right on top of the rack here, uh, above the TV transmitter, and uh, so it's in full view. And uh, uh, every time I, I walk uh, into the shack, my eye glimpses it just for a moment. I think that plastic right transceiver, why that SDR thing? Why don't I use it? <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, we'll get around to it. It's uh, it's another story. Anyway, thanks, Peter, and uh, glad that uh, you enjoyed the session tonight, even though it's gone a little bit over time, but um, oh, it doesn't matter. I can hear something. What's the funny noise? Uh, some, some, something buzzing. I'm not sure what that is, but anyway. Um, I'm just making sure it's not the linear. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, thanks, Peter. Uh, now to a station that's a little bit on the weak side. I don't know how I'm going to go in, in hearing you there, Andrew, but we'll we'll give it a go. VK three K I S VK three E K H. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. VK3KIS, VK3EKH with VK3CSJ on the microphone. No worries, Andrew. And um, I, I think the last question was some, something to do with the um, uh, my uh, uh, the um, uh, the Astrodome or Scope Dome project in the back uh, corner of the property. <sighs> well, what can I say? Uh, it's yet to to, uh, to make any fruition. <laughs> it's. Uh, I'm getting close to it. I am getting close to making a start. I, look, once I get the materials to um, to build this 4x4 deck or something similar, it really won't take long to do. I just got to get around to doing it. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that um, uh, around uh, mid-late July and certainly uh, <clears throat> into August or so, uh, I'll, I'll have the ball rolling in that area. So... Um, uh, we'll uh, keep you all abreast of how that's going. I think that that, that was the the last question there, <laughs> but I am definitely hoping to. Uh, I, I look forward to getting the, uh, the the observatory up and running and having a telescope permanently set up, so I can uh, just just go straight into the dome and set it up and spend a few hours uh, looking at the sky through a genuine telescope. So uh, and of course, ultimately putting a camera on it. So that's another story. Anyway, thanks, Andrew. And uh, uh, your, your signal held up fairly well. Not a problem at all. Now, across to Martin, VK7JAH. I think you were the last one to call in. VK7JAH, VK3EKH. No worries, VK7JAH, Lawn System VK3EKH. Very good, thanks, Martin. Yeah, you're just just above that noise floor. <clears throat> you're just above it, so um, uh, pretty much heard everything you said. And um, uh, I was, I've been hovering around that uh, 30 to 40 over nine, which is pretty good actually. I'm, I'm doing obviously pretty pretty good across the Bass Strait there. So well, excellent stuff. Um, thanks, Martin. Uh, and um, I think that was it. Um, 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 there's something that came into my mind. I said I'm going to think, say something, but I forgot. It's it's just there on the edge of my tongue. I can't remember it now. Oh, anyway, it doesn't matter. All right, uh, it's <laughs> thanks, Martin. Any other stations wishing to check in? BK3 EKH. EKH, VK3VAT. Hello, how are you? Is that you, Tony? The one and only. Uh, g'day, Tony, VK3VAT, and I will add you to the list there at the end. <coughs> oh, dear. So, uh, how are you? VK3VAT, VK3EKH, local lad. Oh, not too bad, not too bad. Uh, 
not too bad, Clint. I thought I'd better make an appearance since I haven't been around for, oh, I don't know, quite a while. I was thinking, since you've got so much noise there, maybe your, your antenna's just too good. Um, <laughs> if your antenna was crappy like ours on these small blocks, you wouldn't get so much uh, interference, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how to say that. It's, um... Well, you know, it's, uh, it's an inverted V, so there's a little bit of uh, horizontal and vertical component associated with it. So, if anything, it's the vertical component that's um, uh, the uh, area that's uh, picking up a, more of the noise, I suppose. Um, but uh, I only have three neighbours around me. The the view, as you know, the view north is uh, open plain. So, you know, the, the noise floor should be less, I would imagine. For this particular location, I would have thought that might have been a little quieter. But, um, you know, I think we can all agree that uh, band noise has definitely increased over the years. And uh, one way or another, and uh, th this is where I've always maintained that um, you know no less than 100 watts here on <coughs> on 160 or 80 meters uh, just to overcome the noise or more. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, thanks, Tony. Good to hear. You. And uh, I, I heard you briefly talking to Richard the other night, although I, I, I turned the volume down on the handheld because I was uh, listening to something on YouTube. So. Um, but uh, good to hear you. Good, uh, good sounding audio too coming from that wireless, and uh, good to hear you. Basically, um, I sent you an email too, uh, or, or message about a uh, uh, the Davis Weather Instrument, uh, the console. That's it. That's called the console. You can actually see it if you when you go to my um, if you go online, you know, to that to the um, weather app, um, Davis Weather app, and type in VK3CSJ console. Um, you should be able to um, to see. Come on, I'm hearing a buzz. I'm definitely hearing a buzz. Just just let me take my headphones off. Where's that buzz coming from? Oh, there goes the headphones. I hate it when the headphones go down to the floor. I've got a buzz happening. Let me investigate where this buzz is coming from. It's all right. We found it. It's just the linear. Uh, the um, uh, the uh, magnetic field around the power transformer is causing the shield, the top cover of the linear, to vibrate. So it just it just needed to be tapped, and that stopped it. <laughs> so uh, there it was. I was just picking that up uh, before, so that's uh, that was easily solved. Um, Anyway, all right, uh, so I think I'll uh, just uh, uh, officially close the net, or I'll close the session and uh, uh, resume to my call sign. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria on behalf of the ASV, concluding this uh, Friday night session. Thank you, viewers and uh, folks for watching and uh, checking in. We'll be back next Friday to do it all again. More information about the station can be found on the qrz.com page, VK3EKH. So just go to the qrz.com to find more info, contact details and whatever. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. But otherwise, the main email address is VK3EKH at gmail.com. So thanks everybody that's sent the email, and particularly Graham, VK6MIL, uh, for uh, sending that email. Most uh, much appreciated. He gives me a, re a report of uh, readability 5, strength 6, 5 by 6, so uh, over in uh, in uh, Malalu. Got to look on the map and find out where that is. Uh, all right, um, VK3 VAT, VK3 CSJ now. Uh, VK3 CSJ, VK3 VAT. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did get your email. Sorry, I didn't actually uh, reply to that straight away. I haven't even yet, but I did see that. Oh, very good. 
Um, yeah, just sort of been keeping out of trouble, uh, just working and being really, really lazy, I guess, <laughs> is the other reason I haven't been on. But, um, yeah, look, the, the noise, I have more noise on two metres, believe it or not. Um, cause someone around here has got some sodden thing, but it's not always there. Like at the moment, I've got S9 noise on two metres, uh, which is really annoying because there was a some of the guys I used to talk to on SSB on two metres, but I just can't hear them anymore oh, really? because of this noise when it's there. But I've got no idea where it's coming from. Uh, I've gone for a wander. I mean, I haven't gone too crazy looking for it. I probably should. But i got no idea where, it's, where it is. I think that's noisier than, than HF. I think my noise floor tonight was about a three. Now, I just presumed if my antenna is not as good as yours, it wouldn't pick up as much rubbish. Now, I might be totally uh, wrong making that assumption as well. But anyway, uh, so what have you been up to? You've got to, while I remember too, you've got to let me know what the size of that, um, uh, what do you call it, that footing for your your telescope. Because I've got the bottom part, as you well aware, but I've still got to do the top part of it. Um, I'll work something out there as well. Uh, VK3 CSJ, VK3 VAT. Yeah, no worries, Tony. VK3 VAT, VK3 CSJ. <clears throat> yes, you're quite right. <laughs> um, look, like like I said to uh, to Andrew uh, VK3 KIS before, um, uh, it's coming. It's June. It's now June, and um, uh, as far as I <clears throat> as far as I know, uh, July in July, or at least as late as August, um, I'll um, I'll have access to a little bit of funds to. Um, uh, to be able to acquire uh, the the uh, the dome, and as a result, before that actually gets shipped here, uh, I'm going to have to have that deck done. So um, I'm really going to get my ass into gear and uh, and uh, come up with a um, a concept of how I'm going to go with it, uh, either fully timber or a metal frame. Um, but uh, I can get quotes for the both both types of deck from uh, from the the Bunnings group, and uh, all I've got to do is get the uh, uh, a bomb a build of materials because you can actually on on the Bunnings website they give you a a deck calculator. So uh, the, what what you do is you uh, submit uh, your information of the deck that you want, mainly the size, and uh, it gives you automatically the material needed for uh, for making that deck so um, uh, but um, I, I, I know I've done that just as an experiment but I um, I, I haven't gone as far as um, submitting that that particular uh, build of materials because uh, the way the website works or I think the way it's meant to be done is that you you print off the um, list of materials and you go to Bunnings and present the the list to um, a store person, and uh, the the I think the idea is that they organise the parts. But all I want is a quote uh, at this stage. I just want a, a cost of um, whether to do it by material by timber or by metal frame. Uh, and that's where it's kind of stagnated. I just haven't gone beyond that at the moment. Um, but uh, I, uh, I've been looking at uh, YouTube a lot. There's a lot of information on um, people that build their uh, dome observatories and the concrete pier, and uh, I've just been getting as much information as I can, and uh, um, I think that uh, I'll have that information soon, uh, Tony, So um, because uh, I can hear that buzz again buzzing sound it's funny you know it, it doesn't normally do that it's just been doing it lately I'll give it another tap hold on a sec here is the fan actually it's the uh, fan inside the, the linear it's making a bit of a rattle so uh, anyway I just gave it a bash 
and uh, we're we're okay again. <laughs> um, so that's where we are with all that. But like I say, I've got to do something soon about it. Um, the uh, um, I've got to remove the grass, um, probably a four by four area. Get rid of this horrible. Um, what, what do they call it? Cooch grass, a kai, kai yuka, or whatever it is, kai something starts with K. Cooch grass, uh, get rid of that. So I'm down to the earth. Um, then dig a, a suitable hole for the concrete pier, or the plug as they call it, and get that concrete poured for that um, and the central pier up. And um, once that's set, and and sticking out of the ground um, then I can build the deck around it so uh, um, yeah it's just a matter of uh, getting the uh, the hardware so the main thing is I need a quote for uh, a metal frame uh, deck and as opposed to a, uh, a wooden frame deck uh, we're working on it and uh, it's uh, it's going to happen fairly soon when it's not raining um, okay, on your noise on two meters, it's so odd to uh, to have a, a noise level on two meters uh, that's uh, um, affecting your um, ability to receive the, the station that you were saying that you were trying to work. Um, I know that with uh, two meter sideband, uh, you know, band noise is already fairly quiet. It depends if you've got a, a, a a low, a low noise amplifier up a masthead amplifier running at the, at the antenna but um, uh, the, the problem with uh, two meters is that there's a lot of birdies um, that you can hear and 144.1 is um, there's a I know here that there's a little birdie that sits just a little bit off frequency and I can't you know if I've got the radio sitting on 144.1 I'm ultimately turning the volume down or maybe turning adjusting the frequency so it's just off frequency enough so that the little birdie is not not a problem and it's things like that um, that uh, cause a few issues in in trying to listen on two meter sideband it's a uh, I mean yes you can find quieter frequencies and that's fine um, but the main calling frequency is 144.1 and there just happens to be a blasted little birdie sitting there uh, so little things like that uh, drive me crazy um, but uh, I suspect that the noise that you're receiving sounds like it's broadband and um, uh, causing your problems so uh, I guess you've got a horizontal beam for two meters because a horizontal beam should uh, minimize uh, that noise to some degree and of course I think you've also got it on a rotator too so uh, uh, that sh you should be able to um, hopefully minimize or find a null for, for that noise maybe, maybe not um, otherwise, uh, yeah, I, I know that you've been doing a lot of uh, working, a lot of hours work, so uh, um, I, I think that's certainly been understood um, since the last time we had words and um, um, it sounds like it's still been happening because um, like you, I, I, I've been pretty much involved with a few things at work that have required a certain degree of concentration, pardon me, and um, I tell you, it takes it takes it out of you. By the time I get home, I'm uh, I'm tired. I'm sitting in front of the laptop, and very soon I'm beginning to close eyes and and uh, nod off for a few minutes. So very uh, very frustrating. Anyway, VK3 VAT, VK3 CSJ. VK3 CSJ, VK3 VAT. Yeah, all that. So busy, busy. Yeah, work. Yeah, mm, I don't know. I'm quite happy to come home to tell you the truth, Clint, <laughs> and go to bed. <laughs> Stay there until I've got to get up and go to work the next day. Um, that's just how I'm feeling uh, at the moment. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if you know they got uh, a bit of uh, bit of happenings there. They got rid of uh, the night shift disappeared for a while, so. They got rid of them, um, but they needed us to, to fill so a few 12-hour days and things along those lines. So anyway, and at the moment I've got a child making noise. You know, but it ceases, never ceases to amaze me. They know when to come out and make noise. Right as soon as you push the microphone button uh, or you're trying to listen to something. 
Isn't that right, Thomas? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, what else is in there? Yeah, this noise, oh, it, but it's like the signal strength's on mine, but you turn, it, it just sounds like white noise. So there's nothing out of the usual until someone not very strong trying to come in on uh, on SSB. Um, because we're all running, um, obviously we're running SSB, but we're all on the verticals, so because we're all over the place. But I haven't spoken to them for a while because I just can't hear them. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll have to play around with it. I did put another two meter Yagi up, but it's not working for me, Clint. So I'll have to play around with that when I can be bothered. Um, but that's pretty much how it is now, though. It's more of a chance of. Well, I've got the time to do it, I think, but it's just, just cannot be bothered doing it. Um, but it should just work. You put these things up in the air, you know, they're supposed to be... Oh, yeah, you just put it together and put it up there and the SWR will be fine, but no. Nah. So, anyway, I've got to look into that a bit further. See if I've done something wrong. i check if all the elements are in the right position, so I know it's not that. The only thing I can think of, possibly, if it's too close to the to the pole at the back, near the reflector, because it's rear-mounted now, I'm not sure. I'd have to uh, see if I can not set it. I know the other one that I did have up there, I've, I've actually swapped Yagi's two metres. Um, the other one that I did have was beside the beam, uh, the the pole, so I knew that was going to sort of throw it out a little bit, but the SWR was fine on that, it just didn't work real good, but yeah, we'll see, we might get back into it, um, and then like ATV, I haven't been on there for a while, um, I was supposed to catch up with Richard today actually, well tonight, but I didn't turn on until tonight, but I forgot all about it, and I got carried away doing other things. Um, yeah, so, yeah, sort of keeping me, keeping myself out of trouble, doing too much overtime. Um, yeah, and things along those lines. But anyway. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so as soon as you know how you're going to do that uh, plug, as you call it, you know you've done the square bit, and I've just got to do the other bit. I'm not sure if you're going to have a steel frame or a steel pole bolted straight to that plug or if you're going to actually continue that plug up like there's a few different ways to do it I think but we're not sure which way we're going to do it but anyway we'll, we'll get there um, what else was there yeah, I think that was pretty much it uh, I can't think of anything much else to, to, to add at this stage that I've been up to which is not much at all um, yeah, VK3, uh, excuse me, VK3 VAT, oh, well, it's nearly tax time, I suppose that's something exciting, not really. <coughs> VK3 VAT, VK3 EKH, CSJ. You, you're uh, not obviously not watching any uh, of the video side of things at the moment. Yeah, I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Yes, I um, oh, I've just decided to uh, put on the other camera, something on a slightly different angle, and uh, playing around with my microphone again. Um, but uh, yes, um, no, I wasn't aware of the uh, the the shift um, being um, uh, um, um, what's the word. Uh, moved or or, or re removed or um, people put, I guess people were put off so um, well I mean you good thank you lucky stars that you've basically still got a job because you could have easily been uh, one of the folks on that list um, and uh, you know God only knows there's uh, there's places all over the place that are uh, shedding staff at the moment um, not in great numbers but it is uh, you know, it, something just recently um, uh, that was going to put off a lot of work and jobs can't remember what that was but you, you shake your head and uh, and you think that uh, in this current cli uh, economic 
economic uh, situation with everything being so expensive, uh, particularly with mortgages, you, you know, people need jobs. They need to get, uh, you know, in some cases, people are taking two jobs, two or three jobs, just to uh, break thing, break even with things. So um, when you hear about uh, um, people losing jobs, it's uh, it's got to be really tough. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm just happy that. Um, well, I want to say happy. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm um, you know, like being involved with electronics manufacturing um, for over 40 years. It's I've been, it's been fortunate for me that I've um, uh, I've been able to to, to be employed for uh, for most of those 40 years. So, um, uh, you know, I guess that's one reason why I've um, uh, I've kept in it. Uh, Principally because there's there's always work in in that area, but even with um, you know with the way COVID hit, hit all of us pretty hard, um, losing the odd customers and um, and manufacturing really going down, uh, we're we're still holding in there. At the at the moment, work is still quiet. Uh, people are still struggling to uh, to find work to do, but they're not losing jobs. You know the the um, the, the company is, is is definitely trying to hold on to the staff, uh, I guess, with the expectation that work will pick up. And we have we have heard that um, probably over the next uh, two to three years, uh, it, things should sort of gradually get back to uh, where they were, you know, three years ago, so before the COVID situation. We were pretty busy then uh, with some of the uh, uh, products that were being made. <clears throat> so um, uh, I'm, you know, I, I, as you know, I was part time there for a while, uh, probably for about fifteen, I think fifteen months or so, eight, almost eighteen months. Uh, I elected to 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 be part time, three days a week. Um, but uh, now, as of the beginning of the year, I was able to uh, come back full time. And the main, main one of the main reasons, as far as I know, that they said, "Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll let you come back on full time," was because of a particular product, um, uh, uh, a device that was brought in that needed to be uh, upgraded, or not, so, no, not, not upgraded, but modified. It had to be machined, and uh, these parts that had to be machined, uh, I had to pull apart the whole thing. Everything had to be dismantled to get to these pieces. So nobody wanted to do it. Essentially, um, it was too 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 of a messy job, and uh, required uh, a certain element of concentration to work on it. So uh, I didn't think I was going to be the one that going to work that was going to work on this uh, particular item, but uh, I ended up being the person. So just just to work on one of these these units is uh, it takes about a week. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a day to dismantle, and to get uh, the parts that need to be m- machined, and then once once we've freed up these items, they they go off to a, a local machinist, and they use a very specialised cutting uh, device. Um, it's not laser, but it's some sort of uh, uh, cutting mechanism. Um, oh, I've, been, I've been told what it is, but I can't remember right now. But it makes cutting through aluminium uh, like butter, and uh, it's uh, very precise. So that takes about a day or two before we get those items back. So in that process, I'm fiddling around with this thing and tidying it up and cleaning it up. There's a lot of MOSFETs that need to be removed and their um, uh, heat sinking compound removed and, and with new stuff uh, put on and that takes about a day or so to muck around so while the stuff is being machined I'm doing this stuff and then so when this stuff comes back the metal work comes back then I've got to basically reassemble everything and that's another day or two um, to do that and then there's a, a little bit of a test that's involved so it's literally a week it takes about four a good four and if I'm not rushed you know four to five days to work on so it's something I, I don't mind because I'm, I'm left to my own devices. I'm not really under the pump. And uh, so far we've done 10 of these things um, since the end of the last year to, to this week. And uh, I've been told that there's another two coming in. So uh, I'm, I can't wait.
you know, because I'm in my own world uh, when I'm working on this. And uh, uh, I, I, I get the mobile phone. Um, <laughs> I tune in the SDR because, uh, I, as you know, I, I like the I, I'm tuning into the coffee break net on uh, on one sixty meters. And uh, so, if I'm not disturbing anybody, um, I, I get my mobile phone and uh, I go to Paul's SDR. That's it there on, on the screen. That's uh, KHZ, the, the Mr. Loops. And uh, I go, oh, play microphone. And I go and press the arrow here. And that then turns on the SDR, which didn't do. There it is. Okay. So there's that's there's the SDR, and that's on eighteen twenty five at the moment. But if I tune into this frequency, coincidentally enough, three five four one, <coughs> there it is, and go to LSB. There I am coming through the SDR there. Instant feedbacks. <laughs> Hello, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And uh, just get rid of this feedback quickly. So there it is, there's my modulation. Check one, two. Oh, am I, I'm on the wrong camera. I'm on the wrong camera, sorry. There we are. So I, I, tune, into the co <coughs> I tune into the coffee break net uh, on this. Let's see, what's that signal? I've got to check my signal out on Paul's SDR. Uh, come on, camera focus. Focus, focus, focus. There we are. Oh, I'm only uh, about an S8. Oh, I thought it would have been stronger than that. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, oh well, all right, there it is. So uh, I I end up tuning to um, 160 meters on the app, and uh, <laughs> um, and uh, at 11 o'clock every morning I, I listen to the guys on the coffee break net, and uh, they they end up acknowledging uh, that I'm there because uh, it'll have Clint at at work. And uh, they'll say, oh, g'day, Clint. Clint's, uh, he's, he's obviously slacking off and not doing his job. Uh, thanks, Steve. So <laughs> anyway, it's, it's a bit of fun. And uh, I, yeah, I can do that without uh, upsetting uh, the masses. It's only for an hour, maybe a little bit more, and then I turn it off. Oh, so, uh, yeah, you've you got to be able to get up on 160 at some stage, Tony. Uh, upgrade the call sign and... Um, and do that <laughs> um yeah so um there it is um i'm i'm now broadcasting the uh, the wa broadcast on 160 in the mornings um i'll i'll kick it off at uh, nine o'clock uh, sunday morning and uh, then as you know repeat it at 10 30 uh on atv so uh uh i uh, i get i get to hear the wa news at least three times now so <laughs> anyway that's Sunday all right um, if you want to depart the scene I'll uh, I'll let you go and uh, get out to Thomas there in the background um, and uh, yeah you, you're gonna have to try and fire up the, your TV meter for uh, next Tuesday's um, um, you know just come up for 30 seconds say hi goodbye that's that's all that's needed VK3 VAT VK3 CSJ VK3 CSJ, VK3 VAT. Yeah, look, uh, I, I'm not so much last weekend. Oh, before I, I go on to that, uh, ATV, the, they weren't, uh, they basically, the people that got put off weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. <laughs> it wasn't. But so, um, yeah, so they sort of, not sprung sleeping when they shouldn't be sleeping. <laughs> Something along those lines are there. Um, as you know, there's their story and then there's their... They don't really tell us much. All we know is that um, they were... One, one was a contractor, they won't be back. 
and one of them was a, one of our guys, um, and he was initially put off. Well, he stood down with pay for two days, um, and then he was supposed to come back and do whatever they do. I don't know what is all this HR stuff, and he just said, "Look, just um, just uh, fire me or whatever." And because apparently this is what was said. He said, no, "I didn't hear this from him or, or the company. This is third." Uh, third party, so I, you, like I said, there's always, it's like when you get divorced, you know, I've been there a couple of times, it's, there's my version, there's hers version, and there's everybody else's version, as you know, so, but pretty much, they got caught, pretty much sleeping on the job, um, on the cameras, you know, disappearing for all this time, and the fact that well, the stuff would be not running all night, and I just hand it over to, to us when we came in in the morning and within an hour of being there, we'd get it running. So I think they just started looking at why was this happening so often. So it's not that we weren't needed, it's just that they weren't performing. But the full story, we'll never know. Um, with the ATV, I look, I come up, well, when I say I come up, last week I didn't turn on, but the week before that, I don't think I turned everything on, or did I? But I was ready to come up or to put a call out, but it just went, it went for so long. Uh, I gotta go to bed, because it was, I think it was after nine, or well, it was coming up to nine o'clock or later, and I don't know, it's just getting too late. But I, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm generally up in the morning at four o'clock, um, and out the door at about 4.30. Um, yeah, so I didn't bother the week before that. I can't remember. But I, I know there's been a few times there where I've had it all turned on, ready to go, and when push came to shove, I just chickened out, <laughs> basically. Um, and I think it just comes down to not playing around like we used to, and then sort of it's like being put on the spot at the last minute um so i yeah and i've done that a few times i've been all ready to come up and then i was just last minute i've just nah i've just chickened out not said anything um i have no i don't even think i've been calling in i think i called him once but um yeah i've been a bit chicken or slack whichever way you want to look at it i'm not sure so i'll have to sort of soak myself up and might even have to turn it on and just transmit um, when I think there's nobody watching <laughs> uh, and see if it all still works. Uh, but um, I was going to do that today with Richard but oh, like I said I forgot all about it or, and got carried away anyway without with doing other things. Um, yes, so I haven't spoken to, well I, I did speak to Richard the other day like you heard. No, when was that? That was, oh, I think it was a couple of nights ago now. I have turned on a few times on your drive time, but I'm guessing you still haven't got an antenna in the, I'm not, sorry, a radio in the car as yet. So it's been quite, I didn't turn on today. And I have not, like, like I say, not all the time, but quite often I'll turn, grab the handy and turn that on if I'm outside or, or doing stuff. Um, yeah, so not too much going on around here. Uh, this radio seems to be, I heard issues with that again, I have to reload everything off the SD card into this radio because I don't know what I did. I think I turned it on, I turned the power supply off, it must have been on, I turned it off and then, I, I don't know, anyway, it's working now. <laughs> I think it doesn't like being, it doesn't like the power being turned off when it's switched on basically. Um, it wants to be uh, switched off at the switch, which is understandable. So there's something there that doesn't like, but it comes good alright once I uh, reload it again. Um, so I must have thought I had the power supply off, but it was on. And I turned it on. I turned it off thinking I was turning it on and when I turned the power button on it, it just went, you know, it goes to come on for that bugger all and then just died. 
course, anyway. And then it wouldn't receive. So these SPRs have got a few little quirky things you've got to get used to, but anyway. Um, it's working now, obviously, because I'm working on it. Uh, I have got another microphone for this, too, I think. I've got the M100. Not that I have it. Had that for a while now, but I haven't plugged it into it yet. So I might, who knows? I might even get game and and play with that when I can be bothered. If I can remember where I put it as well. Um, haven't put that other antenna up yet, as I'm pretty sure they they're not transmitting on uh, Geelong's not transmitting yet. I'm guessing. So that's another another thing to do there. Um, yeah, look, I've just. I haven't done anything, to tell you the truth. I've done bugger all radio-wise. Uh, I've been very slack. Um, yeah, anyway. Not sure, what is it? Quarter past 12, I suppose you're all dying to go and have a coffee. It's not so hard for me, I don't have to run downstairs. <laughs> but, um, yeah. No, all good here. I'll try and make it more of an effort and get on. I should put a radio in the other car. Uh, and like you say, everything's just going up. We've got the car insurance. That's gone up $200 from last year. Why? I don't know. Uh, probably because I don't want to pay for all the, the cars that were damaged in all the other states. They don't want to come out of their pocket. Why would they want to do that? Um, land tax has gone up. Everything's going up. It's just ridiculous. So, you know, how are people supposed to cope? But anyway, I suppose we'll find a way. Um... Yeah, I don't know. VK3CSJ, VK3VAT, just keep doing a lot of overtime, I guess. Oh, you're, well, you're lucky that you you, you do have overtime. Uh, we, we haven't worked uh, a, an hour's overtime in probably the last six, seven years. Um, <sighs> the last lot of overtime uh, was when we were working on a medical product that needed to be uh, made in big numbers. Actually, uh, no, I, well, I wasn't involved, but the last lot of overtime that uh, it was uh, probably brought up at work was, um, oh, excuse me, oh, that came out of nowhere. Um, ResMed, uh, one of the products that we do is uh, for ResMed, uh, which is the ventilator, um, aspirator that thing for uh, people with sleep apnea. <coughs> And uh, uh, ResMed uh, put in some pretty big orders for SRX at the time. And there was, um, um, yeah, there was, uh, I think there was an afternoon shift brought in to get uh, the volume out. I wasn't involved, though, with that at the time. So, um, uh, but oh, it lasted a lot of overtime, I remember, it was I don't know, a long, long time ago. So, um, I don't know, consider yourself lucky that you do get some overtime. But I, I know that also means that the, the, the tax is um, uh, a lot more tax on your pay. And uh, But, you know, I've, I've always maintained that no matter where you do your overtime, um, if it's on a Saturday or a Sunday... You, you, at the, the the bottom line is you you still get a little bit more in your weekly pay packet or monthly whatever it is. Um, so despite the tax, you, you're still getting that little bit more in in your pay packet, and that's at the end of the day that's the important part that you get that little bit more in your in your in your weekly check. <laughs> um, so now that I'm back to full time. 40 to a 40 hour a week um, I, I need to be because um, I I am even for a single bloke um, you know living on my own and um, uh, you know there's I, I'm, I don't have a mortgage to worry about um, and uh, you know, I share the costs for electricity and for water and for the insurance of property and whatever else that might be in that mix. Um, not for the gas. I don't. I don't pay because there's no gas here on the barn. So as a, I, you know, I don't contribute to 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 the gas, but uh, I do uh, contribute to um, 
to uh, the, those other uh, bills. And uh, when you know, when Mum was here, um, her pension there was two hundred dollars coming out of her pension, and the carer's payment that I was getting, you know, uh, the combination of Mum's uh, pension and um, uh, and the carer's payment that I was getting helped uh, a lot to get things done here. But that's all stopped, as you know. There's no longer this extra cash. It's purely my salary now. And I am finding that um, I get paid fortnightly. And uh, I'm finding that um, uh, by the um, by midweek before next payday, I'm, I'm running low on funds. Um, so uh, I've got to try and streamline a few things. And... Uh, uh, yeah, I've got to try and um, cut back on spending. <laughs> it's essentially what it means. But uh, as I as I said earlier on, in July August this year, I'll 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 have a little bit of access to my superannuation, and that's that's going to be. Uh, I'll get a few things done with the super, for that money. Um, there's a few things that need to be done here on the barn, so uh, that really needs to be looked at first. Um, and uh, until we can clear clear the barn of uh, all of uh, the stuff that's still remaining around here from mum's mum's bits and pieces of everything that belongs to her as soon as we can clear this out of the place and and, and have a, an open um, slatter to to start with um, I'll, I'll know where where to start I've been thinking about bringing the shack downstairs and just just the other day uh, I'm thinking about um, maybe uh, keeping the shack upstairs and uh, uh, and maybe moving the bedroom side of the the, uh, the place downstairs so where where my why my workshop is at the moment um, I can I was thinking maybe I can just turn that into a into the uh, into the down, uh, downstairs bedroom, and then and thinking of all the shack can be upstairs. And you know what that means? You know what that means? <laughs> that means uh, um, somehow lifting the Telefunken and the Philips AM transmitter, which you helped me bring in uh, upstairs. Somehow bringing that upstairs. And the first thing that people are going to think is that's extra weight on the uh, the floor up here, and oh well, yes it is. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if uh, a, a two hundred and fifty kilogram transmitter um, brought up here, uh, you know, if I position it in the right spot, the distribution of weight won't be an issue. I don't think it'll be an issue to the uh, to the overall weight up here. Uh, the other transmitter, however, the Philips uh, AM transmitter, might be um, a, a different kettle of fish because that that uh, that can't be easily pulled apart to uh, to bring up here. Um, and I've been thinking, I wonder if you can, there's a hydraulic lift you can get higher, uh, a hydraulic uh, elevator or a hydraulic lift um, with a bit of a platform where I can um, I can push the transmitters onto it and just lift it through the, f the space in the floor or the, f the roof here and bring it up in one whole piece that way. So if that's possible, that might be the way I'll end up doing it. But maybe not. Um, I, I may very well still consider bringing the shack downstairs. I don't know yet. Still make up my mind on that one. <laughs> Um, no, I, I don't have a, a radio in the car, um, which is annoying me. Um, I haven't really repaired the uh, the other radio, and uh, I just don't know what to do about that. Um, so I'm not too sure which direction I'll go. But when I've got access to to the extra funds um, mid uh, this year one thing I, I would like to uh, 
to spend a little bit of dough on is getting a bull bar fitted to the front of the Subaru. And uh, once I fit a bull bar, and it's only the only purpose for that is to mount the HF antenna on. Uh, but what I'm saying is that if I can get a bull bar fitted to the front of the car, I'll put install the HF antenna, but I'll but that'll be the 706 the IC 706 and of course uh, um, that gives me uh, UHF so um, uh, that's that's the thing I'm thinking of is um, is doing that getting the 706 mounted back in the car and uh, and uh, and uh, putting the, the nine foot steel whip uh, on the front of the, the car since it's the only practical place where I can put it on a Subaru Forester. Um, anyway, um, just, just hang 10 a little bit. Once I've got something back in the car for, for access to the repeater, I'll certainly let everybody know so that, uh, you know, when it comes to, uh, to the 3.30 drive time, <laughs> I'll be available, <laughs> but at the moment it's been definitely, um, uh, you know, no, no radio in the car until I get that other unit fixed. If if I do, um, all right. Uh, I think that's uh, about it. It's uh, coming up to half past twelve. I don't think I'll have a cup of coffee, even though I probably could. But like I said at the beginning of tonight's uh, transmission, I'm now experimenting with uh, another diet and this this diet's called keto k-e-t-o or keto ketogenics i think is uh, is another name for it i've never heard it before until my cousin told me about it uh, just about a week ago so it's um it's no carbs you're not you're not eating any any wheat or any uh, potatoes or any vegetables um it's uh you know, low carbs, no carbs, no sugar. You, you completely stop any sugar. And uh, uh, it's basically a meat, uh, a carnivore diet uh, where you're eating meat. And I uh, thought, well, it's got to be a good diet because I don't mind uh, a, a bit of steak. You know, every night's a bit tough, but, I mean, you can have fish alternative nights, but... Um, uh, and and <laughs> and the problem there is, as you know, steak is bloody expensive too. So I've got to work out how I'm gonna how I'm gonna do this. But uh, no more orange juice, uh, no more alcohol, um, uh, and uh, try and get this weight down because um, I'm currently 96, 97 kilograms, and I should be around 70. So. Uh, I could uh, I could go on the old OptiFast, um, but I just can't face the powdered drink at the moment. So the uh, the keto plan is uh, seems like a, a possible uh, goer. We'll, we'll we'll play around with that at least for the next uh, uh, few weeks and see how it goes. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, like the coffee, you can still have your coffee. Um, but uh, of course there's no sugar in the coffee so I've been told that a, a dollop of cream will replace the sugar perfectly well, well not not as in, as in as in a replacement for the sugar because um, cream is pretty much a neutral thing there's no additives in it and it's it's uh, quite safe to put uh, a dollop of cream in the milk uh, in the coffee and not worry about the sugar so uh because I've I've been apparently diagnosed with fatty liver, uh, the idea is to try and get this weight down and try and reverse what what potential damage there is to uh, to the liver, and that means no sugar in anything. So we'll see how we go, um, and hopefully over the next uh, two or three months I'll uh, I'll start to get the, the weight down. <coughs> Anyway, there it is. Um, on that note, I think I'll uh, I'll bas basically make it to the the last. I think for this moment, um, and okay on the ATV too. Uh, well, um, not a problem. 
I'm I'm only really coming up on ATV for uh, the the broadcast and uh, for the, for this session, and uh, and that's about in, in Tuesday night. So uh, uh, it would be nice to be able to come up a little bit more often uh, on the ATV, even if it's just simplex uh, doing simplex across uh, to uh, to folks around here. It would be uh, be just as good. VK3 VAT VK3 CSJ. VK3CSJ, VK3VAT. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, all good. Dieting. Yeah, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure you. I think you're aware I gave up smoking, so I started uh, eating. <laughs> but I've, I've settled down now. Oh, that was three months ago. Um, still, still off it now, which is a good thing. Um, but not, it's still probably, I could probably, I think we could all lose a bit of weight in the end. But, um, yeah, we'll see how we go. I had to slow down because otherwise I was, uh, I think I was eating too much. Um, yeah, okay on the, on the car as well. Yeah, I don't know. I was thinking to put one in the Mazda, but I haven't done that yet. I haven't got... Mind you, it'd be pretty easy to put in the Mazda, um, I think. I've got everything, I just haven't got anywhere to mount the head. The glove box is huge, so there's plenty of room in there. Um, and no, Tom says, hey, you know, I don't want to radio my car, unless that's not your bloody car yet. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, and it's easy enough to pull it out again anyway once he gets it, which is still over two years away. Um, I was going to say, oh, if, if you put the shack downstairs, um, are the cables long enough to reach where you're going to be putting it? So that could turn out to be very expensive if you're going to replace all the cables. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I suppose there's, there's, there's plus and minuses either way, which, whichever way you go, I guess. Um, whether you leave it up there and go down and you know what's going to happen if you do want to move it all you're going to get not even halfway through and you're going to start regretting it because it's going to be a big job um, and then trying to get the other thing up there I don't know uh, I'm not sure the forklift I don't think you're going to get a forklift in the in the house um, a very expensive exercise if you want to get a forklift and try and get it in I don't know how you'd get that up there, actually. I mean, I'm sure there's a way, but uh, I can't think of it at the moment. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. But anyway, I think you'll have to think about it some more and, and go from there, Clint. It's going to be rather interesting, isn't it? So anyway, over time, you look weird. Well, well, we did have a lot of overtime, but now I think... Well, They've, they've cut right back with the overtime. We do still do it, the preventative maintenance side of things, or if something needs doing, but the, they've cut right back. Um, whether it's only for the financial year, I'm not sure. I'm not sure at all. And you are right, look, you, you do overtime, you, you pay extra tax, you do get more money, you know, in, in the long run, and pretty much it all evens out at the end when you do your tax anyway. So, yeah, uh, oh, look, I've never not done overtime because of a tax. The only, the only place that really affects me is with child support, um, where obviously the more I earn, the more she gets. But anyway, that that's not forever either. Um, Thomas is, what, 16 now? It'll be two and a half years, I think. I don't think I can't see him going to university. And, and even that, that wouldn't annoy me so much if it wasn't shared care. <laughs> I was working 51% of the time, I'd pay for everything else anyway. But that's just the way it is. I'm not going to let it get to me. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, what else was in there? Mm, coffee. Diet, a dollop, I don't know why I call it a dollop of cream. Uh, it's just probably, well, I don't think we should enter into that this time of the night. But anyway, I've always wondered why they do that. Um, 
Yeah. All right. I'll, uh, I'll start on you on a fair bit too and uh, fall asleep here. And I'm pretty sure you're, you're, you're yawning your head off there. And I did notice you playing with your uh, call sign when uh, when Tabitha was on as well, moving that around. So I was watching VK3 CSJ, VK3 VAT. Yes, VK3 VAT, VK3 CSJ on TV and YouTube still. Yeah, I... Um, uh, I, I noticed that the uh, the graphics from Tim that was uh, of course one was on top of that, so I needed to uh, manoeuvre that around a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I mean, there's plenty of room up here for the AT, for the ATV. For the whole Radio Shack, I um, if if I if I do move <clears throat> if I do move the 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 bedroom part of this shack, <laughs> um, the bedroom part of this shack uh, downstairs, um, the area that I would do that is um, my current workshop area, uh, so I can I can just see the 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 double bed being nestled in that corner uh, and uh, the wardrobe um, and that's all it is that's that's my bedroom um, but it would mean that um, uh, that I don't have to I you know I I don't have to negotiate the spiral staircase as much um, I would still obviously have to to walk up the spiral staircase to get to here but um, uh, you know, it's it's something that I wouldn't need to uh, bother with every day if I didn't want to come into the to the shack. So um, it would be funny if, because we've been here for a, a living probably twelve years now, and uh, my sleeping quarters has always been up here. So this 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 shack is uh, is one corner. And uh, over that far corner there, we you can't really see. But if I go to the other camera, um, that that glow over there, that in incandescent glow, is the um, is the bedroom. <laughs> so being a, a a single white female, <laughs> as in the movie, single white male. Um, you know, uh, who who cares? Uh, you know, I, I can be playing ham radio till three o'clock in the morning, and when I feel like, you know, dropping dead of of sleep, I could, the bed's just over there, <laughs> and uh, you know, I can go to bed with the sound of of short wave in the background, and and very faint signals, which uh, in the past has been very therapeutic. I I've often gone to, to bed with the sound of lightning crashes and the soft distant sound of um, of the uh, shortwave bands in the background um, yeah but uh, not so much these days <laughs> um, but you know I've got this glow coming from here because I've got things turned on and uh, this part of the room glows at night time uh, but that doesn't worry me. But if I go downstairs, then I, I don't. I, I suddenly lose all that little connection. Um, the, the 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 bedroom becomes a, probably a more dedicated room bedroom. Uh, but I, I would have to work out how to to get the um, those really heavy transmitters up here. And that might, at the end of the day, that just might simply be the deciding uh, factor for um, leaving things downstairs, which is what it was going to be anyway. Um, no, look, um, I, I might need to rerun some cables, but um, I, I would end up taking the cables out of the holes in the wall here. 
and creating a new hole in the wall downstairs and have all the cables coming through one hole through the uh, through the wall um, and coming into the into the new shack and uh, um, and these existing holes down here uh, would uh, you know I would uh, fix up uh, and fill in um, so um, yeah there's a little bit of mucking around but uh, we would probably do that uh, um, yeah anyway all right it's a long weekend so um, um, not that I'm wanting to go cutting grass but I'm, I'm thinking about it the, the grass is at a length right now where I can just go over with the lawnmower and it's easily cut and trimmed so while there's be, while there's no rain, I'll uh, it might be a good idea to uh, to do a bit of a, a grass cut and get that all trimmed up. So uh, I'm not sure when I'll do that though, but it, it won't be Monday. <laughs> so it'll either be tomorrow or Sunday. Depends on the weather. On that note, uh, Tony, good to hear you. Thanks for the words, and uh, I'll try and get. Um, uh, a radio back in the car as soon as possible um, but at the at the at the latest it'll be uh, if I can get a, a, a bull bar fitted to the front and a um, uh, and, a, and the uh, um, a little piece of metal welded to uh, to take a, the HF nine foot steel whip and uh, get that uh, sorted and I'll, I'll, then I'll put the 706 back in the car, which will be nice. It'll be nice to have HF in the car. Um, it was always a bit of fun to have that. All right. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, yeah. VK3 VAT, VK3 CSJ. VK3 CSJ, VK3 VAT. Yeah, no worries, Clint. Yeah. Oh, I've got, well, not that I use my car, because I've got the air pillar going in the garage, I'll take the, I can't um, put the antenna on, or leave the antenna on, or even the, the local, the 2 and 7, you've only got a little one on, if I go, if I'm going to go for a long drive, I'll put the bigger one on, but uh, around here it works fine anyway, but not the, not, oh, I could put the HF one on, but I can't do 80, unfortunately, not with that, um, I don't know what it is now, the Yaesu, or oh, what is it, the Aztec, as, as, as as whatever it is, it doesn't tune 80 up, so as I could, um, with the Yaesu, I could put the, oh, could I, I could buy a tuner, you know, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> there's just too many, too many options, too many things you can do, um, and then I'm thinking, well, there's no one on the bloody radio anyway, generally. So, yeah, and that's why I don't turn it on, because I've just got into that habit where no one's on. And like I think Dennis was saying at one stage, he said, everyone's listening, including me sometimes, but nobody says anything, so we just presume there's no one there. <laughs> we're probably all just sitting there. Well, I don't sit here in front of the radio. I mean, I've got it on, but I'll be buzzing around. If I hear someone, I'll uh, come up generally. Anyway, all right. Here you go, and um, I don't know. If you're not going to have coffee, drink a cup of tea. I've got no idea. Um, have a Milo. No, that's not going to That's an energy drink. That's going to keep you awake, too. Um, so none of that stuff keeps me awake. Um, I'll have a coffee and go straight to bed and fall asleep straight away. Not a drama. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. You have a good night. Good to catch up. And I'll try and um, not stay away for as long in the future. Uh, um, who knows, I might even slow you around what the end is a long weekend. Today is Friday, so I might even, at some stage, when no one's looking, I'll turn the transmitter on and um, try and see if I can still hit the, the ATV repeater, uh, RTV I should say, um, and see if I can still get into it, which I presume I should be able to do, unless something's gone wrong out there. 
All right, Clint, you have a good night, and I'll uh, talk to you, you know, hopefully over the weekend. Um, VK3 CSJ, VK3 VAT. Yeah, no worries, Tony. And I was, that, that was the other thing I was going to say too, was the um, the other ATV repeat is still being worked on, uh, the uh, Mount Anarchy Geelong repeater. Uh, so as far as I know, uh, that's still being worked on. Um, so likewise, I, I haven't uh, uh, done with anything with the antenna side of it either yet. Um, yeah, so I've got a... I've got a um, uh, there's a little bit of antenna work I've got to do, um, and uh, yeah, I don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, there's the uh, 40 meter log antenna that I want to put up, and I still need need to get bits and some metal work from Scott, uh, the fellow that I bought the antenna off. So uh, as soon as I get that metal work, I'll I'll be able to take a stab at putting this antenna up and that's a big job it'll be um, a fairly big job um, and uh, anyway so that's that one um, 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 but yeah uh, at this stage uh, we haven't done anything with the uh, reception of uh, the Geelong repeater so we'll have to work on that one um, oh, just before we uh, conclude, uh, did you feel that earthquake the other day at 11.41 on, I think it was Sunday night? No, negative, I didn't. It did wake me up. I can't say that I felt it, nor heard it. Um, I had a look on the... On the on the app I've got, and I'm not quite in the, I was in a, a shaky spot, um, obviously not rock underneath me or something along those lines, but it did wake me up, like I said, I did hear it, and I thought, oh, what was that, and then I heard something in the bathroom rattle, um, but when I say rattle, it wasn't as if I, I, I didn't feel anything moving myself, I just heard a bit of a, a rattle, I don't know, just a tremor, I went back to sleep. Um, <laughs> but I, it, I heard something like, it sounded like something jumped on the roof, to tell you the truth, that's what initially woke me up. Um, apparently the next day there was one at five o'clock, but, and it was just, someone was saying it was just a loud bang, but I didn't hear that one, I was, I was asleep, that's why I was having a little, uh, and a nap at that time in the afternoon after work. But uh, did you feel it at all, Clint? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> um, I was uh, in the kitchen making a cup of coffee. <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, I noted at the time as, as, as 11.42, uh, but it was actually 11.41. And uh, it was the magnitude 3.8. Eight, I think it was 3.8 or magnitude 4 earthquake centered uh, just uh, west of um, Sunbury and uh, 10 kilometers deep so it was fairly shallow uh, and uh, I, I heard it it was the it was the audible sound first um, before the house you know before the whole barn shook um, I mean I've I've you know, experienced a few earthquakes now, and um, uh, I, I'm, I'm always mightily impressed when the, it's a fairly significant vibration that that you can see has mo that moves the place. And uh, I was making the cup of coffee at uh, at 20 minutes to 12 midnight, and uh, I thought, oh, we've uh, we've just had that's definitely an earthquake or an earth tremor, uh, and uh, it, it only went for about maybe um, five seconds or so, but uh, there was well, there was an after shock, uh, which was much less, and I didn't didn't sense that. Um, the next, I think the next day or the second day, there was an earth tremor in the Croydon area, um, which wasn't aware of that. So it's a certain magnitude um, where uh, the, the 
the um, the the pressure wave is uh, it's significant, and you're gonna you're gonna sense it. So that was that was mightily interesting. Um, I always love those things. I always find earthquakes and tremors and you know most fascinating stuff, <laughs> providing it's only small. Um, yeah, but um, uh, it certainly lit up the radio waves, um, as in the three three LO was uh, was active. A lot of people calling him. So, um, uh, um, but I, I still remember the the big earthquake uh, uh, last year sometime with the um, out there at Mansfield in central northeast Victoria, uh, which was quite uh, quite powerful. And I, I mean that was that was at work. I, I was at work when that happened. That was around about I think uh, nine, let's say nine thirty in the morning when that occurred, and. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it shook the factory. I, I was able to see, physically see the, the walls moving to some degree, and I was looking up at the ceiling, expecting the uh, suspended ceiling to to actually end up collapsing. So that that was a, a mightily interesting earthquake, and had everybody talking for a whole day. So. <laughs> but there's fault lines all over the place. You know, Victoria is one great big fault. And um, you know, there's earth tremors happening all the time. It's just they're so small and, and local that you don't really notice it. But um, uh, there's a, there's a couple of areas that uh, are hot spots and uh, potential for uh, for volcanoes to, uh, to to spring up if it so happens. So I reckon that'd be fantastic for a volcano to suddenly uh, uh, make itself known. That would be interesting. Even Mount Dandenong is an, an extinct volcano. Wouldn't that be great if it, be, it became active? All the TV towers go for a big melt. <laughs> anyway, Tony, I'll catch you later. I'm talking nonsense. VK3 W, uh, VK3 VAT, VK3 CSJ. VK3 CSJ, VK3 VAT. Yeah, I think Mount Dandenong is a bit too close for my liking. Um, <clears throat> Uh, maybe somewhere in the Blue Mountain. Let them have it. Um, yeah, I definitely remember that one. Yeah, I, I was at work that morning too. And I, uh, uh, anyway, walked out. And all the girls started screaming as they do. Uh, walk out there. And we got monitors hanging off the wall. Of course, that place is all. Um, oh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, I think of the word. It's getting too late. But we, we had uh, things still shaking on the roof um, for a while afterwards after it settled down. So they suspended off poles hanging down about you know, two metres. Um, yeah, but I, did, like, I was in bed the other day when that one went to so, so I know it woke me up. And I know it was, a, I looked at the clock, sort of, I think it was 11, whatever it was, 11 something. Um, yeah, but that, that, I didn't really feel it. I did have a look on the app, and I think, like, I'm not sure about where you are, but it's funny how you sort of have a look at the, the way they mark it and where it's felt more than other areas, and where I was, it wasn't felt so much as to where I think further, closer to Berwick, it was felt, it was more pronounced. Anyway, I don't know. And then the only way I can, I don't know how that works, like you say, the shock waves. And I suppose it depends on on what's underneath too, if you're on more dirt than rock or whatever along those lines. But anyway, all right, I'll let you go and I'm going to disappear as well. Um, nearly one o'clock in the morning, not that I have to get up, but uh, I, I'm, I quite like sleeping in nowadays. I could stay there all day, <laughs> unfortunately. And uh, we'll, uh, I don't know, talk some more later on down the track. So you have a good night. Oh, I'm not sure if I'll have a coffee now. Uh, not because that'll keep me awake, but I'll have to get up and go to the loo at some stage. Uh, and that's just as bad. Um, yeah. All right, uh, bk 3 CSJ and bk 3 BAT, you have a good night, Clint. And I'll uh, talk to you sooner rather than later, hopefully. Yep, no worries, Tony. VK3VAT, VK3CSJ. 
Sure will. Uh, not a problem at all. Um, definitely good to catch up. And um, uh, and like I say, I must get a, um, a radio in the car. Um, and uh, uh, okay, on the earthquakes too. Yep. Um, so sometimes some of these quake occur at, at odd hours and uh, sometimes at, at during the night when you're pretty much already asleep. So I didn't, uh, it took me an hour to get to sleep last night. Um, I um, I think I, I just, I, I finally drifted off. At, I think it, it must have been 2.30 or so. So I haven't had much sleep. Ooh. Excuse me. So I shall uh, definitely turn things off now, and um, and I won't have a cup of coffee, even though I could, but I won't. And uh, I'll go downstairs and uh, lock things up, and uh, give my uh, uh, little uh, little pussy cat a cuddle, and um, and then close, turn off the lights. I think it'd be a good idea to uh, to hit the sack about now. Cheers now. Take care. VK three VAT VK three CSJ. Cheers, mate. All right, this is VK three CSJ, and uh, we shall conclude uh, transmissions on uh, the TV repeater VK three RTV one, and uh, also on YouTube. So for those that have been uh, doing lots of watching emissions um thank you for watching and uh <laughs> if there is any of an audience out there send us an email vk3csj is it yeah that's right vk3csj at gmail.com works as well anyway all right we're off uh, off the video side of things so stand by for uh, color bars and test tone or maybe just color bars anyway thanks for watching